head, spine, and neck injuries. A patient with a head, neck, and spinal injury should never be moved if, his or her life is not in danger. The life is only in danger, if the patient is not breathing, and has no pulse. The first aider must understand the mechanism of the injury, get the full story or history from bystanders, and if the casualty is conscious, allow him or her to explain the course of events. Study the emergency scene, for clues to establish the nature of the injuries. Common symptoms. The following symptoms could be present. Changes in consciousness. Vision and breathing problems. Nausea and vomiting. Inability to move a body part. Steady headache. Tingling or loss of sensation in hands, fingers, feet, or toes. Blood in the ears or nose. Seizures. Severe pain, pressure or bleeding in the head, neck or back. Bruising of the head. And, loss of balance. Treatment. When the patient must be moved, it has to be done as a unit, with the spine in a straight line. Four first aiders, or helpers kneel on one side of the patient, that has been immobilized. One first aider, the leader, holds the head of the injured in his hands, while the next places his or her hands on the shoulder and side of the chest. The next first aider places his or her hands on the hip and the outer part of the upper leg, while the last first aider controls the feet. The first aider at the head, is in charge and on his or her command, and on the count of three moves the patient as a unit onto his or her side. A stretcher is placed under the patient, and on the count of three, from the leader, rolled back onto the stretcher. These are considered critical injuries, and take precedence over the rest, and emergency services should be called. Do not move the patient, unless you are positive there are no spinal injuries. You must always prevent any further damage to the spine, and never move your casualty if it is not necessary. Spinal nerves, if pinched, can cause paralysis. Conditions, when casualty can be moved. When casualty is not breathing, and has no pulse. When conditions dictate that the casualty has to be moved for example, if the car is on fire. Procedure when transporting. Make sure the patient is fully immobilized, and prevent further injury. Move the patient as a unit, with the head, neck and shoulders aligned. Check the patient's airway, while transporting. See that all equipment stays fastened. If you have to move the casualty. The general rule is, don't move an injured person. However, some situations require you to break this rule. The risk of moving. You risk further injuring the victim, when you move an injured person. Every move carries the risk of spinal or neck injuries, that can result in, permanent paralysis or death. Even if it does not appear, the victim suffered neck or back injuries. Such injuries are often, invisible. When to take the risk? The victim, is in more danger remaining where he or she is. For example, the victim is in a burning building. The victim is in an area off limits, to rescue teams. For example, the victim is inside a radioactive area, where setting rescue workers up for access, would take so long as to be life-threatening. It is impossible to aid the victim, in his or her present location. For example, the victim is unconscious inside a vessel, and you must use an extraction harness, to get the victim out where treatment is available. When directed by the emergency personnel, such as a company nurse, emergency medical technician, or firefighter, to move an injured person. The two key reasons for moving somebody with a spinal injury are to turn the person onto her back, in order to resuscitate her, and to turn her into the recovery position, if she is unconscious, and in a position that does not allow her to maintain a clear airway. Neutral position. The best position for a person, with a suspected neck or spinal injury is the neutral position. Here the head is in line, with the neck and spine. To move a person into the neutral position, grip the head firmly over the ears, and move it slowly into line. Once in this position, do not give up this support, until medical help arrives, to take over from you. Only use this technique, if you have been trained to do so. Moving the person with a spinal board. To get the person onto a backboard safely, you must log roll the injured person, to keep the neck stable. Using this technique, you roll the person to one side, and slip the backboard under the victim. Then, you roll the person in the other direction. If at all possible, use a stiff board or medical backboard, underneath the injured person while a second person, maintains the neutral position of the injured person's neck. If time permits, splint and stabilize injured, or fractured extremities, before moving an injured person. You may need to use your own clothing, or that of the victim. 
If moving is so vital that you cannot wait for rescue personnel, then use whatever is on hand to get the job done. Move the victim to a safer area, and call for help. Remain with the victim, and provide additional first aid at the safer location. Moving the person, without a spinal board. Use the log roll technique. One of the most effective ways, of turning a person over is, the log roll technique. Log roll can also be used to turn somebody, with a spinal injury onto her side, as an alternative to the recovery position. It is also commonly used, to move people with other injuries, such as a broken leg, or pelvis onto a stretcher, or blanket. Ideally, six people should be used to carry out this technique, with one person taking the lead, and control of the head. Place your hands over the ears with your fingers along the chin. Hold the head in the neutral position. Ask the supporters, to gently move the arms to the side of the body, and to move the legs together. Ask the supporters, to support the spine and limbs, and to follow your commands. Roll the casualty like a log, keeping the head, and chin in line with the neck and spine. If you are by yourself, and the injured person is not breathing, do not waste time searching for help. Turn the person, as carefully as you can, with any help available to you. General precautions. Do not, attempt to set a broken bone, or move it back into place. Simply try to keep it immobile, while you are moving him. Do not clean a wound with peroxide, bleach, or any harsh chemicals. Do not, even attempt to clean the wound, unless it is an acid or caustic burn. In that case, flush the wound with water. Do not slap the victim in an effort to keep him, or her conscious. It is not important, that the victim is conscious, only that he or she continues breathing, until help arrives. Do not give anything to eat or drink. If the victim is thirsty, provide a small amount of water. Conditions, when casualty can be moved. When casualty is not breathing, and has no pulse. When conditions dictate, that the casualty has to be moved for example, if the car is on fire. Procedure when transporting. Make sure, the patient is fully immobilized, and prevent further injury. Move the patient as a unit, with the head, neck and shoulders aligned. Check the patient's airway, while transporting. See, that all equipment stays fastened. Okay, we're going to be demonstrating the lock roll. Sydney, you are at the head. Matapelo, you are above the hip and below the knee. And I'm going to be at the shoulder and at the hips. Now what we do is we crisscross the patient's arm. There we go. Now the reason why we're doing the lock roll is for head, neck and spinal injuries to protect the airway. The person at the head is the person in charge of the lock roll. First aiders, we lock roll in three. One, two, three. First aiders, lock roll back. One, two, three. Head injuries. Injuries to the head, are always regarded as serious because, they can inflict damage to the brain, and spinal cord as well as damaging the bone and soft tissue. As a result, head injuries can be devastating to the patient. Head injuries can be invisible to the eye. In many instances, a patient who appeared unaffected after an incident suddenly collapses, with life-threatening symptoms some hours later. This may be due to the sudden movement, of the head forward and backward, on impact which may cause a small bleed in the brain, that eventually increases and applies excessive pressure on the brain tissue. Such injuries can easily mislead, the first aid provider by not exhibiting the expected signs and symptoms, immediately after an incident. As a first aid provider you should always, take head injury seriously. Always check the patient's response, and whether they have any alteration of consciousness. Look at the history of the incident, and the mechanism of injury. If in your opinion, the patient's conscious state is altered, or the incident had the potential to cause serious injury, assume the worst, and treat as a serious head injury. Understand the mechanism of the injury. Get the full story or history from bystanders, and if the casualty is conscious allow him or her, to explain the course of events. Study the emergency scene for clues, to establish the nature of the injuries. Head injuries can be either open, for example a head injury with an associated head wound, or closed with no obvious sign of injury. Symptoms and signs. Bruising and or redness. Dazed or confused reactions. Patient may vomit. Unusually slow pulse rate. Pupils dilate irregularity. Visible or obvious fracture. Blood in or fluid coming from, nose or ears. And, unconsciousness. 
Treatment for head injuries? If a head injury is determined or suspected, maintain open airway. Suspect cervical also known as a neck injury. Position your patient, with head lifted if head injury. Do not put anything under the head. Make sure that the injured side of the head, faces the ground, so that fluid can drain. Control any bleeding. Dress any wounds. And treat for shock. What not to do? Leave the victim alone, especially when they is sleeping. Wake them up, every three to four hours, and have them answer simple questions, to make sure there is no brain injury, such as a concussion. When to seek medical attention. Call the medical emergency services if the victim exhibits seizures, dizziness, vomiting, nausea, or obvious changes in behavior. Scalp wounds bleed profusely, because the scalp has many blood vessels. Control bleeding, by applying pressure on the wound. Replace any skin flap to the original position, and apply pressure. Another option is applying an ice pack, or instant cold pack to control bleeding. If you suspect a skull fracture, do not apply excessive pressure. Doing so, may push bone pieces into brain. Press on the edges of the wound to help control bleeding. Apply a dry, sterile, or clean dressing. Keep the head and shoulders raised, if no spinal injury is suspected. If bleeding continues, do not remove the first blood soaked dressing. Instead, add dressing over it. Evacuate the patient for the following reasons. The wound is extensive. There is significant facial damage. There are signs of concussion. For example, nausea, vomiting, headache, and drowsiness. Skull fractures is a break or a crack in the cranium that may be open or closed. It is difficult to determine a skull fracture, except by X-ray or CT scan, unless it is severe. What to look for? Pain and skull deformity. Bleeding from ear or nose. Leakage of cerebrospinal fluid, also known as CSF, which is a clear or pink-tinged, watery fluid, draining from ear or nose. Discoloration around eyes or behind ears, known as battle signs. Battle signs may appear several hours after the injury. Unequal-sized pupils. Heavy scalp bleeding. The skull and or brain tissue may be exposed. Penetrating or impaled object. What to do? Apply a sterile or clean dressing over wound, and hold in place with gentle pressure. Harder pressure can be applied on the edges of the wound, to avoid pressing bone pieces into brain. Control bleeding by pressing on edges of the wound, and gently on center of it. A donut-shaped pad, is useful in applying pressure around edges of a suspected skull fracture. Evacuate the patient, and seek medical assistance urgently. A traumatic brain injury, is not an injury specifically to the head. It is an injury to the brain itself, that causes most short and long-term problems. Mishandling a person with a brain injury, could result in permanent damage or death. The brain will swell from bleeding when it is injured, and swelling of brain tissue can interfere with brain functioning. The brain may be damaged if it strikes the inside of the skull. When a patient sees stars, it results from the occipital lobe, which is the part that controls vision of the brain, when the lobe hits the back of the skull. The nerve cells of the brain and spinal cord, are unable to regenerate. The type of injury the brain receives, may affect one or more functional areas of the brain, or the entire brain. Brain injuries can be caused by a penetrating foreign object, by bony fragments from a skull fracture, or by the brain striking the inside of the skull. When a person's head hits a stationary object, it is called a deceleration injury. When a person's head has been hit by a moving object, it is called an acceleration injury. Sometimes there will be two points of injury. One at the point of impact, and one where the brain rebounds off the skull, on the opposite side. A concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury, also known as an MBTI, and occurs when a blow to the head alters the function of the brain. Recovery can last from several minutes, to months, or longer. Most people with a concussion make a full recovery. Patients whose symptoms last longer than three months, suffer from post-concussion syndrome. Other traumatic brain injuries include the following. Contusion, which is a direct blow to the head. Coup contra coup, which is a blow to the head, that is strong enough to cause a contusion at the site of impact, or move the brain so that it hits the opposite side of the head. Diffuse axonal. This is the shaking or strong rotation of the head, that causes a tearing injury. Shaken baby syndrome. This happens when babies are violently shaken and their brain rebounds against their skull. Penetration, when a bullet, knife, or other sharp object enters the brain. Contamination. Hair, 
skin, bone, and pieces of the penetrating objects enter the brain. These objects may not be retrievable. Unconsciousness. It is important to remember that the brain is the control center of the body and controls the working actions and functions of the body. If a patient is unconscious, but breathing normally then you should place them into the recovery position to protect their airway. It is best to place your patient in a stable, comfortable, and safe position. The recovery position involves rolling the patient onto their side with their head tilted back. By doing this, the tongue is kept clear of the airway, and any vomit is able to drain, and not obstruct the patient's airway. What about injuries? At this stage, do not worry too much about the patient's injuries. Your main priority is to protect the airway, assist with breathing and control life-threatening bleeding. Once the person has been placed in the recovery position, you can start assessing and treating any other injuries which you have found. The advantages of the recovery position. The airway remains open and tongue cannot block it. Gravitational drainage can take place for example, vomit will be expelled. The pulse especially the carotid can easily be monitored. And it is a safe and comfortable position for your patient. Treatment. Provide and maintain an open airway. Treat the cause. Place in recovery position. Treat for shock. Seek medical help. And monitor vital signs every two minutes. Fainting. Fainting is a brief and sudden loss of consciousness, normally due to a reduction in the blood flow to the brain. Normally, a faint result in a person falling to the floor. The brain requires a constant supply of oxygen and nutrients. This supply is provided by the blood. There are numerous things that can interrupt this supply. For example, blood tends to pool in the legs during periods of inactivity, for example, standing or sitting for long periods of time. If you suddenly stand up, the heart has to work harder to pump this blood upwards against gravity. This can cause a head rush in some people with a feeling of dizziness. However, in other people, this interruption in the blood supply to the brain causes them to lose consciousness called a faint. Generally, once a person has fainted, and fall into the floor, they regain consciousness very quickly. This is because when lying down, the heart finds it easier to pump blood to the brain, as it is not working against gravity. There are some telltale signs that someone is going to faint. They may go very pale white, and look unsteady on their feet. Also, they may complain of feeling, light-headed or, funny. Treatment for a faint. If someone complains of feeling faint, you should lie them down, on the floor with their feet elevated until they feel better. This is to prevent any injuries occurring if they do fall. If someone has fainted, you should raise their legs to improve the blood supply to the brain. If they have fallen, check for any injuries, such as fractures or head injuries. Once they recover, help them sit up gradually. Do not let the patient stand up straight away, as they may just faint again. If the patient does not wake up, check to see if they are breathing. If they are, roll them onto their side in the recovery position and call an ambulance. If the patient recovers fully and has not suffered any injuries, there is no need to call an ambulance. If they are not sure what caused the faint, or have not fainting before, then it is advisable for them to seek medical attention. Epilepsy is a disruption of brain function, that interrupts the normal electrical activity of the brain. Normally, neurons, which are cells that carry electrical impulses, allow communication between the brain and rest of the body. In epileptics, Neurons fire or send electrical impulses toward surrounding cells, stimulating neighboring cells, to fire at one time, causing an electrical storm within the brain, which results in physical changes called seizures or fits. It is only when there is a tendency to have recurrent seizures, that epilepsy is diagnosed. In 70% of all cases, the cause of epilepsy cannot be identified. Head injuries, strokes, brain tumors, infections such as meningitis, lead poisoning, or injury during childbirth mostly cause the remaining 30%. There are many different types of seizures. The main types of seizures are tonic-clonic seizures, absence seizures, complex partial seizures, simple partial seizures. Tonic-clonic seizures are convulsive seizures. The body stiffens, which is called the tonic phase, followed by general muscle jerking, which is called the clonic phase, and involves the whole brain. The person loses consciousness, their body stiffens and limbs jerk. These seizures generally last up to 3 minutes. After the seizure the person may want to sleep, or they may have a headache, or be confused and disoriented. 
The person may experience an aura, which can precede a tonic-clonic seizure, and this may act as a warning, giving the person time to seek a safe place before losing consciousness. Non-convulsive seizures. An absent seizure, causes the person to lose contact with their surroundings for about 30 seconds, with little or no outward sign, that anything is wrong. This type of seizure mainly occurs in children, and is often mistaken for daydreaming, or lack of concentration. A complex partial seizure, is accompanied by impaired consciousness and recall. It may also involve staring, automatic behavior such as lip smacking, chewing, mumbling, walking, grunting, or the repetition of words or phrases. The person may experience an aura, which can precede a complex partial seizure. A simple partial seizure, produces a sudden shock like jolt to one or more muscles, which increases muscle tone and causes movement. These sudden jerks, are like those that occur in healthy people as they fall asleep. Care and treatment of tonic-clonic seizures, although tone is grand mal seizures. Roll into recovery position as soon as jerking starts. Keep the patient in the recovery position by supporting him or her, and allowing the jerking to still continue freely. This will protect the patient's airway, and minimize any vomit that may enter the lungs, which can cause severe infection. Protect from harm. Place something soft under head. Loosen tight clothing and any ties. Reassure until fully recovered. Do not put anything in the patient's mouth. Do not restrain the patient. If the seizure occurs while the person is seated and strapped in, leave them seated, until the seizure is finished. Support their head and neck during the seizure. After the seizure, place the patient in the recovery position if they are unconscious, or if there is food, water or vomit in their mouth. Care and treatment of other seizures. Absences seizures, also known as petty mal seizures. No active treatment required. Only reassure the patient. Complex partial seizures, known as focal seizures. Protect the patient from harm. Reassure the patient until fully recovered. Do not restrain the patient, unless he or she is at risk of injury. Simple partial seizures. No active treatment required, except to reassure the patient. One problem encountered by the first aid provider, is that of the well-meaning, but untrained, bystander. This person may insist that the epileptic's tongue should be held, before they swallow it. The bystander should be discouraged from actively pulling the patient's tongue out, or placing anything in the patient's mouth. Most epileptics understand what happened to them, and as soon as they recover sufficiently, they continue on with their business. They do not usually require ambulance care, and may become upset when one is called. However, as the first aid provider, you must satisfy yourself, that the person is recovering normally and that there appear to be no complications. When to call for an ambulance? A complex partial seizure lasts longer than 15 minutes. Another seizure follows quickly. Food or water is in the mouth during the seizure. It is the first known seizure. The person has been injured. The person has breathing difficulties after the jerking stops. The person is a diabetic. The person is pregnant and has a convulsive seizure. The seizure has occurred in water. The seizure lasts longer than 5 minutes. The seizure lasts longer than normal for that person. You are in any doubt. And when you arrived after the seizure has started. A stroke is a condition, in which a part of the brain, ceases to function because its blood supply is disrupted, cutting off the oxygen supply, to the brain cells. Severe strokes, can cause permanent paralysis to parts of the body, or even death. Strokes can occur at any age, but usually occur in the middle-aged, or elderly people and, is often associated with high blood pressure. Seek immediate medical assistance. A stroke is a true emergency. The sooner treatment is given, the more likely it is that damage can be minimized. Every moment counts. If you suspect that a person is having a stroke, call an ambulance immediately. In the event of a possible stroke, use FAST, to help remember warning signs. Face. Does the face droop on one side? while trying to smile? Arms. Is one arm lower when trying to raise both arms? Speech. Can a simple sentence be repeated? Is speech slurred or strange? Time. During a stroke, every minute counts. If you observe any of these signs, call the ambulance, or your local emergency number immediately. The patient could have the following symptoms. Severe headache. Change in the level of consciousness. Unequal size of pupils of the eyes. Paralysis of the muscles of the face, with difficulty in speaking, and swallowing. Numbness, 
or paralysis of the hands and feet. Particularly on one side. Mental confusion. Loss of bladder, and bowel control. A warm, clammy skin. And. Convulsions. Treatment. Give lots of tender loving care. Make the person comfortable, and place in the half-sitting position, to the affected side. An unconscious person, is placed in the recovery position, to the affected side. Loosen constricting clothing, do not give anything to drink. Maintain body temperature. Alert the emergency medical services. Monitor breathing, and pulse and start with CPR if no breathing and pulse. Do not, leave your patient alone. A transient ischemic attack, is a minor stroke. A stroke from ischemic, results from impaired circulation in one, or more blood vessels of the brain. This is usually due to thrombosis, an embolism, or systemic hypoperfusion. The blockage is short-term. The clot usually dissolves on its own, or gets dislodged, and symptoms usually last for a short time. TIAs are sometimes called mini-strokes, because their symptoms last only for a few minutes, up to 24 hours, before disappearing. But warning stroke is a better label, because ATI often foreshadows a full-blown stroke, and needs to be taken seriously. Anyone can have ATIA, but the risk increases with age. If you have previously had a stroke, pay careful attention to the signs of ATIA, because they could signal a second stroke in your future. The warning signs for ATIA are the same as a stroke, and sudden onset of the following. Weakness, numbness, or paralysis on one side of your body. Slurred speech, or difficulty understanding others. Blindness in one or both eyes. Dizziness. Severe headache with no apparent cause. Treat as an emergency, since ATIA is a warning sign of an impending stroke. The same treatment steps for a stroke is used by the first aider. A heart attack, occurs when blood supply to a part of the heart muscle is partially or completely blocked. The lack of oxygen to the tissue, causes a part of the heart muscle to die, which is known as myocardial infarction, and may disrupt, or stop heart action. As with men, Women's most common heart attack symptom is chest pain, or discomfort. Women are somewhat more likely than men, to experience some of the other common symptoms, particularly shortness of breath, nausea or vomiting, and back or jaw pain. Do not wait to get help, if you experience any of these heart attack warning signs. Some heart attacks, are sudden and intense. But most start slowly, with mild pain or discomfort. Pay attention to your body, and call the emergency services if you experience any of the following. Chest discomfort. Most heart attacks involve discomfort in the center of the chest, that lasts more than a few minutes. Or it may go away and then return. It can feel like uncomfortable pressure, squeezing, fullness or pain. Discomfort in other areas of the upper body. Symptoms can include pain or discomfort in one, or both arms, the back, the neck, the jaw, or the stomach. Shortness of breath. This can occur with or without chest discomfort. Other possible signs include breaking out in a cold sweat, nausea, or lightheadedness. Treatment for heart attack include the following. Give lots of TLC. Place the person in the half-sitting position. Assist the conscious patient to take prescribed medication. Loosen constricted clothing around the neck, the chest, and the waist. Treat for shock and maintain body temperature. Alert the EMS and monitor breathing and pulse. Do not leave the patient alone. If the heart stops, start with CPR immediately. Angina. Angina is spasm of pain in the chest, usually caused by the inability of diseased coronary arteries to deliver sufficient oxygen-laden blood to the heart muscle. When insufficient blood reaches the heart, waste products accumulate in the heart muscle and irritate local nerve endings, causing a deep, vice-like pain that is felt beneath the breastbone and over the heart and stomach sometimes radiating into the left shoulder, and down the inner side of the left arm. A feeling of constriction, or suffocation often accompanies the pain, though there is seldom actual difficulty in breathing. Pain, usually subsides after 3, or 4 minutes. In acute cases, the skin becomes pale, and the pulse is weak. Anginal pain may be quite mild in some cases, but its peculiar qualities, can still induce anxiety. An anginal attack can be relieved by rest, or by taking nitroglycerin, or other drugs that relax and dilate, the blood vessels. Angina may be stable, or unstable. A stable angina is persistent, recurring chest pain, that usually occurs with exertion. 
An unstable angina is sudden, new chest pain, or a change in the pattern of previously stable angina, that may signal an impending heart attack. Angina is relatively common, but can be hard to distinguish from other types of chest pain, such as the pain, or discomfort of indigestion. Signs and symptoms may include the following. Chest pain or discomfort. Pain in your arms, neck, jaw, shoulder, or back accompanying chest pain. Nausea. Fatigue. Shortness of breath. Anxiety. Sweating. And. Dizziness. The severity, duration, and type of angina can vary. If you have new or changing chest pain, these new or different symptoms may signal a more dangerous form of angina for example the unstable angina, or a heart attack. If your angina gets worse or changes, becoming unstable, seek medical attention immediately. Heart failure is a general condition, in which the heart muscle does not contract and relax effectively. This reduces the performance of the heart as a pump, and compromise blood circulation throughout the body. Heart failure is not a specific disease, but the result of many different underlying conditions, such as a myocardial infarction, hypertension, cardiac valve insufficiency or stenosis, and exposure to toxins. At first, the heart tries to make up for this by doing the following. Enlarging. The heart stretches to contract more strongly, and keep up with the demand to pump more blood. Over time, this causes the heart to become enlarged. Developing more muscle mass. The increase in muscle mass occurs, because the contracting cells of the heart get bigger. This lets the heart pump more strongly, at least initially. Pumping faster. This helps increase the heart's output. The body also tries to compensate in other way, for example. The blood vessels narrow, to keep blood pressure up, trying to make up for the heart's loss of power. The body diverts blood away from less important tissues and organs, like the kidneys, the heart and the brain. These temporary measures mask the problem of heart failure, but they do not solve it. Heart failure continues and worsens, until these compensating processes no longer work. Eventually the heart and body just cannot keep up, and the person experiences the fatigue, breathing problems, or other symptoms, that usually prompt a trip to the doctor. The body's compensation mechanisms help explain, why some people may not become aware of their condition, until years after their heart begins its decline. Heart failure can involve the heart's left side, right side or both sides. However, it usually affects the left side first. Treatment by the first aider, is the same as for a heart attack. Cyanosis is a blue coloration of the skin and mucous membranes, due to the presence of less than 5 gram per deciliter, deoxygenated hemoglobin, in blood vessels near the skin surface. Although human blood is always a shade of red, the optical properties of skin distort the dark red color of deoxygenated blood, to make it appear bluish. During cyanosis, tissues are uncharacteristically low on oxygen, and therefore tissues that would normally be filled with bright oxygenated blood, are instead filled with darker, deoxygenated blood. Avoiding exposure to cold temperatures or warming the body, may eliminate cyanosis related to cold temperatures. Oxygen may be needed to relieve shortness of breath. Cyanosis is divided into two main types, namely central, which is around the core, the lips, and tongue, and peripheral, which is only the extremities or fingers. Treatment for cyanosis include the following. Give lots of TLC. Place the person in the half-sitting position. Loosen constricted clothing around the neck, the chest, and the waist. Treat for shock and maintain body temperature. If necessary, warm the body to improve the flow of blood. Alert the EMS and monitor breathing and pulse. Do not leave the patient alone. When water accidents occur, one used to think only about drowning. Other water accidents may involve unconsciousness, like when a patient got injured by diving into the base of a swimming pool, causing neck, back and spinal injuries. Any accident that may occur on firm soil is also possible in water. The danger from a water accident is, that the water now becomes the threat in the unsafe condition. Any patient from a water accident, should be treated in such a way, that the breathing of such a patient is not endangered. Water may easily pass into the lungs, specifically when the patient is unconscious, causing the patient to suffer from asphyxia. Another factor that may play a major role, is the fact that hypothermia may occur, when a casualty has been immersed in cold water for a long period. Drowning is defined as death by suffocation, after immersion in liquid. Near drowning is defined as an episode, in which a person initially survives immersion in liquids. Drowning can happen in many ways, but all deaths from drowning are due to lack of oxygen 
called asphyxiation. It is not important whether or not the lungs fill up with water, or whether there is salt water or fresh water. What matters, is how much oxygen continues to reach the victim's brain. Drowning can be the result of cold, fatigue, injury, disorientation, intoxication, or limited swimming abilities. The drowning victim struggles to breathe and inhale air. Eventually the victim inhales water, or goes into a muscle spasm of the vocal cords which closes the airway. Loss of consciousness, convulsions, cardiac arrest, and death may follow. Causes of drowning include the following. Alcohol consumption, which impairs coordination and judgment. Boating accidents. Child abuse or neglect, for example bathtub and bucket drowning. Diving accidents. Falling through the ice in a body of water. Fatigue or exhaustion. Illicit drug use. Inability to swim. Incapacitating marine animal bite or sting. Having no life preserver. Failure to observe water safety rules. Muscle and stomach cramps. Scuba diving accident. Seizure, stroke, and heart attack while victim is in the water. Sustaining a head and neck injury, while involved with a water sport. Suicide attempt, and unsupervised swimming. The management of drowning. The chain of survival for drowning is followed for the management of drowning victims. Link 1. Prevent drowning. In a near-drowning emergency, immediate action and first aid can prevent death. For adults, the following are recommended. Get proper training if you want to swim. Swim, when possible, in the presence of a lifeguard. Lifeguards should be hired in swimming pools for the general public. Never swim alone in unknown and very deep water. Do not swim in the absence of a trained person if you do not know how to swim. If you are a beginner, always wear a personal flotation device when you enter a lake or pool, or ride in a boat. Always check the depth of the water before diving. In children, the following are recommended. Never leave a child alone near water, swimming pools, or any large container of water. Never turn your back on an infant or baby in a bathtub. A child could drown or get seriously injured in seconds, the time taken to answer a phone or go to the door. Teach your child how to swim. Tell your children never to swim alone, and never to swim too far from shore. Warn your children to always check the depth of water before diving in. Keep young children out of the bathroom, unless supervised by an adult. Put childproof handles on doorknobs, if necessary. Link 2. Recognize distress. The instinctive drowning response, so named by Francesco Pia, is what people do to avoid actual or perceived suffocation in the water. And it does not look like most people expect. There is little splashing, no waving, and no yelling or calls for help of any kind. Drowning does not look like drowning, Dr. Pia described the instinctive drowning response like this. Except in rare circumstances, drowning people are physiologically unable to call out for help. The respiratory system was designed for breathing. Speech is the secondary or overlaid function. Breathing must be fulfilled before speech occurs. Drowning people's mouths alternately sink below, and reappear above the surface of the water. The mouths of drowning people, are not above the surface of the water long enough for them to exhale, or inhale, and call out for help. When the drowning person's mouth is above the surface, they exhale and inhale quickly, as their mouths start to sink below the surface of the water. Drowning people cannot wait for help. Nature instinctively forces them to extend their arms laterally, and press down on the water's surface. Pressing down on the surface of the water, permits drowning people to leverage their bodies, so that they can lift their mouths out of the water to breathe. Throughout the instinctive drowning response, drowning people cannot voluntarily control their arm movements. Physiologically, drowning people who are struggling on this cannot stop drowning, and perform voluntary movements such as waving for help, moving toward a rescuer, or reaching out for a piece of rescue equipment. From beginning to end of the instinctive drowning response, people's bodies remain upright in the water, with no evidence of a supporting kick. Unless rescued by a trained lifeguard, these drowning people can only struggle on the surface of the water, from 20 to 60 seconds before submersion occurs. This does not mean that a person that is yelling for help and thrashing isn't in real trouble, they are experiencing aquatic distress. Not always present before the instinctive drowning response, aquatic distress does not last long, but unlike true drowning, these victims can still assist in their own rescue. They can grab lifelines, throw rings, to name a few. Look for these other signs of drowning, when persons are in the water. Head low in the water, mouth at water level. Head tilted back with mouth open. Eyes glassy and empty, unable to focus. 
eyes closed, and hair over forehead or eyes. Not using legs, and in a vertical position. Hyperventilating or gasping. Trying to swim in a particular direction, but not making headway. Trying to roll over on the back, and appear to be climbing an invisible ladder. Link 3, Provide Flotation. Unless the drowning victim is a small child, rescuing a person without a flotation device, is a task that requires strong swimming skills. This is why it is always wise, if people are near, to ask for help. Other useful flotation devices for rescuing a drowning victim, are lifeguard tubes, life buoys, kickboards, or children's floaties. Essentially, any object that will assist you in keeping the drowning victim's head above the water, will prove helpful. Link 4, Remove the Victim from Water. Remember to call for help. You want someone else to be aware of the situation. They can also aid by phoning the emergency services, as well as help with CPR. If you want to assist someone in trouble in the water, and you can reach the person with an object, you should do the following. Stay out of the water. Brace yourself on a pool deck, pier surface or shoreline. Reach out to the person using any object that extends your reach, such as a pole, an oar, a paddle, a tree branch, or a belt. When the person grasps the object, slowly and carefully pull him or her to safety. Keep your body low and lean back, to avoid being pulled into the water. If you want to assist a drowning victim without an object, you must be sure of your swimming abilities. Victims are often thrashing and panicking, which can make it hazardous to perform a swimming rescue. Do not to swim right up to the victim, since he or she is likely to push you under the water. Approach the victim from behind, and place your arm around the person's chest. Swim backwards to safety. Remove the victim from the water with a spine board, if a head and spine injury is suspected. Link 5, provide care as needed. When the victim is out of the water and onto dry ground, check for a pulse and breathing. If no pulse and breathing is present, start CPR immediately. Do not hold children by the feet, and try to shake the water out of the lungs. The CPR process will expel water from the lungs. If you are alone, first provide 5 cycles of CPR before leaving the victim to call for help. If the victim is breathing and does have a pulse, turn the victim in the recovery position. The patient could have the following symptoms. Unconscious. No breathing. No pulse. Skin temperature of the patient is cold. Skin color is blue. General signs and symptoms of asphyxia are present. Treatment of a drowning victim includes the following. If the victim is unconscious and not breathing, get the casualty out of the water. If you have to swim a long way with the casualty, Give one breath every five to six strokes into the casualty's mouth. On reaching the shore, lay the patient on a firm surface. Look for a pulse, if no pulse could be felt start with CPR. If a pulse is present, proceed with rescue breathing. Let someone seek medical help, and continue with treatment to get the patient to breathe. If the victim is unconscious, not breathing, and bleeding. Treat is the same as the previous steps. Control the bleeding. The type of bleeding, will determine the type of treatment to stop the bleeding. Carry on with treatment to get the patient to breathe. Seek medical help urgently. If the victim is unconscious, but breathing, remove the patient from the water. Look for breathing and a pulse. If the patient is bleeding, control the bleeding. Treat for shock and put the patient in the recovery position. Seek urgent medical help. A pneumothorax can be a medical or a trauma-based condition and a potential emergency wherein air or gas is present in the pleural cavity. Air moves into the chest cavity causing the lung to collapse. A pneumothorax can occur spontaneously, as the result of disease or injury to the lung, or due to a puncture to the chest wall. A pneumothorax can result in a collapsed lung. It most commonly arises due to the following. Spontaneously, due to the weakening in the pleura. Following a penetrating chest wound. And following barotrauma to the lungs, usually presented in scuba diving. It may also be due to some of the following. Chronic lung pathologies including emphysema and asthma. Acute and chronic infections, such as tuberculosis. Lung damage caused by cystic fibrosis or lung cancer. It could be a simple, an open, or tension pneumothorax. A simple pneumothorax could occur during trauma, or spontaneously after coughing. The patient experiences a severe pain when inhaling. Only one side of the chest moves and shock develops. An open pneumothorax is the result of an open wound to the chest, and air is sucked into the thoracic cavity. Moist sucking or bubbling sounds can be heard, when the patient breathes. The patient experiences shortness of breath, and the chest fails to expand normally. He could cough up blood and turn blue. A tension pneumothorax is when the inhaled air cannot escape, thus causing pressure in the chest cavity. 
The buildup of tension can put pressure on the heart and unaffected lung. The trachea can deviate, bulging towards the uninjured side. Subcutaneous emphysema may be present. A tension pneumothorax is a life-threatening condition. Treatment includes the following. Evaluate breathing and support if necessary. Place the conscious patient in the semi-seated position. Cover the open wound with an airtight dressing. Tape three sides to the chest wall. This prevents air from entering the chest cavity during inhalation. The air in the chest cavity escape through the fourth side during exhalation. Manage shock and monitor vital signs every 5 to 10 minutes. Activate the emergency services, as this is a true emergency. The patient must be hospitalized as soon as possible. A hemothorax is caused by blood leaking into the thoracic cavity. It often accompanies a pneumothorax. This is a serious condition and a patient could lose up to 3 liters of blood. The symptoms of a hemothorax may include chest pain and difficulty breathing, while the clinical signs may include reduced breath sounds on the affected side, and a rapid heart rate. A hemothorax is usually caused by an injury, but they may occur spontaneously, due to cancer invading the pleural cavity, or as a result of a blood clotting disorder. It may also occur due to an unusual manifestation of endometriosis, or in response to a collapsed lung. Hemothoraces are usually diagnosed using a chest x-ray, but they can be identified using other forms of imaging, including ultrasound, a CT scan, or an MRI. Treatment include the following. Evaluate breathing and support if necessary. Place the conscious patient in the semi-seated position. Cover the open wound with an airtight dressing. Tape three sides to the chest wall. This prevents air from entering the chest cavity during inhalation. The air in the chest cavity escape through the fourth side during exhalation. Manage shock and monitor vital signs every 5 to 10 minutes. Activate the emergency services, as this is a true emergency. The patient must be hospitalized as soon as possible. This injury is caused by an object that enters the chest wall and possibly the lung, such as a bullet or knife, even being impaled by a stick. A hole in the chest makes a new pathway for air to travel into the chest when it expands. That hole pulling air into the chest cavity is called a sucking chest wound. The frothy appearance comes from air mixing with the blood. You may also hear a sucking sound, which is why it's named sucking chest wound. Sucking chest wounds are dangerous because they lead to collapsed lungs. Treating a sucking chest wound requires two things, keeping air from going in while letting extra air out. It can be difficult to identify when a penetrating wound to the chest is sucking air or not, so it is best to assume any penetrating wound to the chest is a sucking chest wound. Seal the sucking chest wound as soon as possible. Put something plastic, preferably sterile or at least clean, over the hole and tape it down. Leave one corner out, this will act as a valve allowing air to escape, and in the meanwhile preventing it from entering the wound. However, this does not always perform its purpose. Blood tends to glue the plastic to the wound. Careful observation works much better than improvised chest seals. There are chest seals made specifically for sucking chest wounds, but nothing beats careful observation. Watch for signs of a tension pneumothorax. If the pressure builds too much, the victim will develop a dangerously low blood pressure, go into shock, and likely die. Remove the seal if necessary. If you suspect a tension pneumothorax is building, take off the seal to allow the air to escape. If you do have to remove a chest seal to relieve a tension pneumothorax, you probably should leave it off. Removing this seal will most likely let the pressure out and equalize the pressure inside the chest with the outside atmosphere. Again, watch the victim closely for signs of tension pneumothorax. Recognizing a tension pneumothorax is difficult if you have not been trained in first aid. If you have a victim of a penetration wound to the chest of any kind, due to an industrial accident, gunshot wound, or stabbing, the most important step is getting professional emergency medical help. Do not hesitate to call an ambulance or get the victim to the emergency department as quickly as possible. Rib fracture. Ribs are pretty hard to break. They are surrounded by strong muscles and usually can take a lot of abuse before they crack. The elderly can get broken ribs easier than younger adults. Kids have more flexible bones. Most broken ribs, including children, come from vehicle accidents, but they are also common from falling off horses, sports injuries, and falls. Most of the time, the broken rib is only broken in one place, and is an incomplete fracture, meaning not all the way through the bone. Completely broken ribs may, or may not move out of place. If they do move, 
they are called displaced rib fractures and are more likely to puncture lungs or damage other tissues and organs. Ribs that stay in place, usually ribs that are not completely broken in half, are called non displaced rib fractures. Broken rib complications. The most common complication of broken ribs is not being able to take a deep breath because it hurts. If you do not breathe deep enough, mucus and moisture can build up in the lungs and lead to an infection such as pneumonia. Displaced rib fractures can damage other tissues or organs and sometimes lead to collapsed lungs or internal bleeding. Treatment. Do not wrap tight bandages around the chest. Support the chest with a pillow. Manage shock and monitor vital signs. A change in breathing can indicate the development of a pneumothorax, also known as a collapsed lung. Flail chest refers to a serious breach in the integrity of the rib cage for more than one adjacent rib broken in more than one place each. Instead of rigidly holding the normal shape of the chest, a flail chest results in a segment of the chest wall flailing back and forth in the opposite direction of the rest of the chest wall as illustrated. In other words, a flail chest is broken ribs with an attitude. When a patient is hit by something hard enough to break off a section of ribs and leave them dangling only by the surrounding meat, the result is a section of spare ribs flailing back and forth, opposite of the rest of the rib cage. This is a dangerous injury that requires emergency medical treatment. If not treated promptly, flail chest can lead to a collapsed lung or blood around the heart. Act swiftly. Stabilizing the flail chest. Use a pillow to put pressure on the flail segment. Holding the flail segment in place keeps it from moving in an opposite direction as the surrounding muscle and bone. If it doesn't move, it won't cause more damage to the heart, lungs, and surrounding tissues. If a pillow is not available, almost anything will do to stabilize the flail chest. Roll up a jacket or a blanket. If there is absolutely nothing available, at least have the victim lie on the affected side of the chest to discourage it from moving. Regardless how a flail chest is treated, it is going to hurt, probably worse than anything the victim has ever encountered. Over-the-counter pain medications are not going to do much for this level of pain, and stronger painkillers are not to be given until emergency medical help is available to provide the full range of emergency treatment. Never take, or give, to another victim, someone else's prescription medications. Always make sure that victims of flail chest get to emergency medical treatment. Failure to provide proper treatment for flail chest can lead to pneumonia and other life-threatening conditions. Signs and symptoms. Pale, cool, clammy skin. Rapid, weak pulse. Shallow, difficult breathing. Paradoxical chest movements. Cyanosis meaning a bluish skin. Pain, especially when breathing in. Care and treatment. Call an ambulance. Apply a firm pad over the flail section. Apply a firm bandage in place. Position the patient in a posture of comfort, usually sitting. If unconscious, position on the injured side. Reassurance. Observe carefully for signs of breathing difficulties. Evisceration. Is an abdominal injury, in which the organs are actually visible. These wounds are incredibly serious, and help needs to be obtained immediately. Dial your local emergency numbers. The person will likely not feel much pain with this sort of wound, but unless you are trained, you should not provide aid. Often, the people will claim to feel okay, and may even be able to walk around. Make sure there are no materials touching the organs that will stick to, or damage the delicate membranes. Signs and Symptoms Obvious Protrusion of Organs Pale, cool, clammy skin Rapid, weak pulse, with evidence of shock Rapid, shallow breathing Maybe fecal odor, if organs have been lacerated Anxiety And nausea Care and treatment. Call an ambulance immediately. Cover organs with non-stick dressing. If unavailable, a clean dressing kept wet, with saline or even a plastic wrap. Speak to the person. Soothe them. And help them try to remain calm. If unconscious place the patient in the recovery position and monitor CAB. Do not attempt to replace organs back into the abdomen. Substances such as gases, for example carbon monoxide, poisonous fumes like insect repellents, and smoke can be inhaled. Once inhaled, these substances cause severe damage to the respiratory system. General signs and symptoms of inhalation poisoning include the following. Distinctive smell of poisons or gases, or evidence of containers, or gas in the atmosphere. 
the nervous system may be affected causing slurred speech. Drooling, impaired vision, uncontrolled muscle spasms, loss of balance, or paralysis. Shock may develop within minutes, hours, or even days. Level of consciousness will deteriorate, from dizziness to unconsciousness. Breathing may be affected. Breathing will be difficult due to swelling, gurgling due to excessive saliva, or fluids on the lungs. The skin becomes cold and clammy. Treatment entails the following. Ensure your own safety, by covering your mouth and nose with a wet handkerchief. Ventilate the area, or move the patient to fresh air. Gather information from the patient, any bystanders, the family, or the environment, and try to identify the substance. Contact the nearest poison center, and or the emergency services. Manage shock if present. Croup is an acute respiratory illness of young children, that is caused by a virus. The virus causes an infection of the upper airway, in the region of the larynx, also known as the voice box. They have a barking cough, a raspy voice, and make a high-pitched, squeaky noise when they breathe. At first, a child may have cold symptoms, like a stuffy or runny nose, and a fever. As the upper airways, including the larynx and trachea, become irritated and swollen, a child may become hoarse, and have the barking cough. If the airways continue to swell, breathing gets harder. Kids often make a high-pitched or squeaking noise while breathing in, this is called strider. They also might breathe fast, or have retractions, seen when the skin between the ribs pulls in during breathing. In the most serious cases, a child may appear pale or have a bluish color around the mouth, due to a lack of oxygen. Another severe form of croup is epiglottitis, which is the inflammation of the epiglottis, just above the larynx. This is generally caused by a bacterial infection. This condition may also lead to total airway obstruction, and generally requires a stay in hospital under close supervision, until the child starts to recover. Symptoms of croup are often worse at night, and when a child is upset or crying. Treatment for croup include the following. Calmly reassure the child, and help them into a comfortable position, usually sitting. Measure the child's temperature. If they are running a fever, treat it. Breathing in warm humidified air, may help to calm down and distract the child. Make sure the water is not too hot to avoid burns. Monitor their breathing and level of response closely. If the episode of croup is severe or persists, access emergency medical care. Asthma is a chronic disorder of the lungs, in which inflamed airways are prone to constrict, causing episodes of breathlessness, wheezing, coughing, and chest tightness, that range in severity from mild to life-threatening. Inflamed airways become hypersensitive to a variety of stimuli, including dust mites, animal dander, pollen, air pollution, cigarette smoke, medications, weather conditions, and exercise. Stress can exacerbate symptoms. Acute asthma attacks are increasing episodes of shortness of breath, cough, wheezing, or chest tightness associated with a decrease in airflow. These attacks may require emergency room treatment or admission to hospital. Factors that precipitated the acute asthma episode should be identified and preventive measures implemented. Acute asthma is preventable, with optimal control of chronic asthma. The cardinal symptoms of asthma are cough, tightness of chest, wheeze, and shortness of breath. Acute symptoms are episodic, and are managed by self-medication, with a reliever medication. Signs and symptoms may include Difficulty breathing Wheezing and coughing A tight chest, it may feel like a band is tightening around it. Distress and anxiety Difficulty speaking shown through short sentences, and whispering. Signs of hypoxia, such as gray-blue tinge to the lips, ear lobes, and nail beds. Exhaustion, in the case of a severe attack. Treatment. Reassure the casualty, and ask them to take their usual dose of their reliever inhaler, which is usually blue. Ask them to breathe slowly, and deeply and focusing on breathing out. If they have a spacer available, ask them to use it with their inhaler. The inhaler is more effective with a spacer, especially when being used for young children. If they have no inhaler call for emergency help. Sit them down, in a comfortable position. A mild attack, will normally ease after a few minutes. However, if they do not improve within a few minutes, it may be a severe attack. Ask them to take a puff, every 30 to 60 seconds, until they have had 10 puffs. Help the casualty to use their inhaler, if they need assistance. If the attack is severe, and they are getting worse, becoming exhausted, or if this is their first attack, call for emergency help. Monitor their breathing, level of response and pulse rate. 
If they become unresponsive at any point, prepare to give CPR if their symptoms improve, and you do not need to call the emergency services, advise the patient to get an urgent same-day appointment, to see their general practitioner. Pneumonia is an inflammation and consolidation of the lung tissue, as a result of infection, inhalation of foreign particles, or irradiation. Viral pneumonias are primarily caused by viruses. Symptoms of viral pneumonias include a runny nose, a decreased appetite, and low-grade fever, usually followed by respiratory congestion and cough. Viral pneumonias are usually self-limited, and can be treated like a cold or bronchitis. Bacterial pneumonias are often very severe, and require antibiotics. Signs and symptoms of pneumonia include the following. Persistent cough with colored sputum. Fever and chills. Chest pain during exhalation. Shortness of breath. A headache, a sore throat, and muscle pain. Weakness and fatigue, as well as sweating. Treat the same way as for a cold. Monitor the patient's breathing, level of consciousness and pulse. If their symptoms improve, and you do not need to call the emergency services, advise the patient to get an urgent same-day appointment to see their general practitioner. Bone injuries or fractures. Fractures are classified as open and closed fractures. A fracture is when there is movement of the bone, where there should be no movement. There are two types of bone injuries or fractures, namely, open fractures. Broken bone tears through the skin, causing an open wound. Closed fractures. Skin is not broken. Common symptoms. The following symptoms could be present. Pain or tenderness at place of fracture. Inability to use limb. Swollen. Discolored. Irregular line of the bone, under the skin, known as a deformity. Shock. Crepitus, the grating noise as the broken end of the bone, rubbing against each other. Sometimes shortened. The following rules apply to splinting a fracture. Secure above as well as below the fracture. Secure above and below a joint. The splint that is being used, must be hard and long enough, to support the fractured bone. Always support the long bones. Splint the fracture in the position you find it. Always check for pulses, capillary refill, comfort, and movement. Always feel for a pulse below the injured part. When no pulse is detected, seek medical assistance immediately. Do not try to move a patient with a severely broken bones, unless it is absolutely necessary. Calling emergency services is the best course of action in this case. However, if you must move the patient, you must immobilize the injured body part. One way is to splint it, but only do this if it can be done without hurting the patient, and always attempt to splint the part in the position you found it. Splint the injured area. You may use another body part, like an injured leg to an uninjured one, or an injured arm to a chest. This is called an anatomic splint. Make a soft splint from folded blankets or towels, or use a triangular bandage to make a sling. A sling is another type of a soft splint, which is used to support an injured arm, wrist, or hand. Use folded magazines or newspapers, cardboard, or metal strips, to support the injured body part with a rigid splint. Use several folded triangular bandages to secure the injured body part to the splinting material, tying them securely, but not too tight. Raise the injured part, and prevent the patient from getting chilled, or overheated. Pelvic fracture. The pelvis is surrounded by strong muscles, and you will seldom find open fractures. Direct, or indirect impact can cause pelvic fracture. Occasionally, bone fragments can lacerate the rectum, vagina, bladder, blood vessels or uterus. As a result, 40% of the patients will develop hypovolemic shock. Signs and symptoms. Severe pain in the pelvic area, and with movement of the legs. Tenderness on firm compression, and palpitation. Treatment. Stabilize pelvis, with broad bandage. Place a rolled blanket between the legs of the patient, and tie the legs together. Turn patient, as a unit onto a full trauma board. Monitor vital signs. Manage shock. Okay, here we're going to demonstrate how to secure the pelvis, if there's a pelvic fracture. Demonstrate what we're going to do to the patient. You're going to need, if you want to use it, a splint, a sheet, and plus minus five triangular bandages. So what we do, we just push the sheet in underneath the patient. Alright, and then you just see exactly it's underneath the patient. 
Make sure that it's more or less 50-50. There we go. We bring the ends together. And we twist. Okay. Secure on top. And then we wet the knot. This is just to make sure that your knot doesn't slip. And then it will nice and tight. And we tie it off again. All right. The drying and the bandages. Sydney, can I ask you to open one for me so long, please? My tapero, my extra bystander. Here we go. Keep it as a broad bandage. Okay? So all we do is we just open them nicely. Okay. They fold it like that. So we need to quickly fold broad bandages. There you go. Okay. So the rule says above a joint. Now here comes the trick. Usually when we tie on the legs because there's a fracture, just check your capillary refill or you can check for pulses on the feet if they are present. So, tie above the knee joint. We tie below the knee joint. Remember to check your pulses and your capillary refill. Okay. And then we have another joint here at the bottom, which we can use here at the ankles. Yeah. Okay. But now this one, because it's a long bone, we are also going to support the long bone. So what I suggest is, just to pull this one into position first. There we go. And then my, I have another angular bandage piece. Oops, sorry. like this or you can add another bandage and tie the feet properly mm -hmm. nice together as well first aid for life-threatening bleeding including amputations bleeding from a wound is considered life-threatening if the flow of blood is continuous and if the volume of blood loss appears large a manufactured tourniquet should be used first for life-threatening extremity bleeding and should be placed as soon as possible after the injury. A self-made tourniquet can be used if a manufactured tourniquet is not available. Tourniquets can be improvised from sticks, pipes, and triangular bandages, taking care not to use any thin cloth or materials like shoelaces, as these can cut through the skin when tightened. Tourniquets are applied 10 cm above the injury, at least 5 cm in width, and not removed until the patient arrives at the hospital. It is important to record the time of placing the tourniquet and informing the emergency personnel or doctor of the tourniquet that has been placed. Do not cover the tourniquet with any bandages or clothing to make it easily visible to the emergency personnel and doctors. If a tourniquet is not available or not controlling the bleeding, direct pressure with the adjunctive use of a hemostatic dressing, if available, should be used to treat life-threatening bleeding. Hemostatic agents such as Celox and Quick Clot are designed to promote rapid blood coagulation in the event of a traumatic wound involving an arterial bleed. Training should be done on hemostatic dressings before they are used by the first aider. Wounds with life-threatening bleeding located on a body part that is not on the arms or legs, such as the head, neck, chest, 
abdomen, shoulders, or hips, cannot be stopped with a tourniquet. Tourniquets are also not applied over a joint. These life-threatening wounds are packed with materials like gauze, or any other clothing. Packing the wound means to take the material, and place it tightly into the wound. You then apply direct pressure, and a compression dressing. Treatment for amputations. After bleeding is controlled as mentioned. Collect amputated part, keep dry, do not wash or clean. Seal the amputated part in a plastic bag, or wrap in waterproof material. Place in iced water, do not allow the amputated part to come in direct contact with ice. F. Freezing will kill tissue. Ensure the amputated part, goes to the hospital with the patient. Often the part can be reattached using microsurgery. If bleeding occurs through the existing dressing, place a second dressing over the first, leaving the existing dressing in place. Maintain direct pressure over the bleeding area as much as possible. Avoid disturbing the bandage, or pad once the bleeding has been controlled. Wounds can be cleaned with clean water, or a saline solution. My name is Av Rios, and I'm a paramedic with Lansing Mercy Ambulance on behalf of Expert Village. In this clip, we're going to go over tourniquet use to help control blood loss. Tourniquets should be used only as a last resort for blood loss control. A tourniquet should only be applied once you've came to the conclusion that you are not able to control the blood loss with direct pressure, elevation, and pressure point combined. Once you realize that that is not controlling the blood loss, what you're saying to yourself is, I'm now going to put a tourniquet on. This tourniquet is going to cut off complete blood flow to the extremity. You're going to, by lacking the uh, extremity from getting the blood flow it needs, it's going to actually start to die and tissue necrosis will begin. What that means is by putting on the tourniquet, you're saving the person's life from the blood loss, but you're sacrificing that limb and it should have to be amputa amputated if put on correctly. This is an example of a commercial product that you can buy. Anything can be used similar to this, such as a piece of clothing or belt. Once you've opened this from the package, you will have the triangular bandage. What this is very similar to is a bandana. I'm not going to open it all the way up because for the sake of this, I want it to look just like this. What you want to have is approximately two inches wide of material. You always want to go approximately two inches above the injury site also. For this sake of this example, we're going to say that I have a, I'm losing blood from my, just above my knee here. It is an arterial bleed, which means it is bright red squirting blood. I've been unable to control it with direct pressure and elevation of my leg. And by pushing on my femoral artery right here, I was still not able to control the blood loss. I then move into my tourniquet. It's important to remember the two by two rule. If this is my injury site, you wanna go two inches above the injury site, and you wanna go have a material to use your tourniquet approximately two inches wide. So what you wanna do is put it right over the, right above the injury site. You then wanna make sure that this is extremely tight and come up to the top and make a small knot and try to get that as tight as you can. You're not able to actually pull this tight enough to completely occlude the blood flow. It's very important that this is extremely tight because if you'd only put it on partially, what you're gonna do is squeeze the blood vessels, which is still gonna have blood flow and gonna cause the bleeding, but it's actually gonna increase blood flow because it's, the body's gonna think that it's having a lack of the blood. So it's gonna to try to increase the blood flow to that injury site. So it's, make, it's very important that if you decide to put on a tourniquet, you're going to completely occlude all blood flow to the extremity distal of that spot. Next you want to use something, I'm going to use a pencil for this. You can use a pen, anything long, a little bit hard. You can even use a stick. Just set it right over the injury site. What you're then going to do is just wrap the ends around like this. and give it another tie here. This is just tying it in place. What you're now going to do is start to actually spin it around. As you spin it, it's going to tighten here. I'm going to stop it here for the sake of I don't want to cut the blood flow off completely to my leg. But that'll be sufficient enough 
Once you have it as tight as you think you can go, or to the breaking point of whatever object you use, what you then want to do is secure it in place. If I let this go, it'll start to spin itself around again and release. So what I want to do is lock it in place. I do this by taking my two ends that I have left and wrapping it around and then tying itself back together again. Keep in mind it's going to release just a little bit, but it should stay in place. Arthritis is an inflammation of the joints and its effects. In its acute form, arthritis is marked by pain, inflammation, redness, and swelling. Osteoarthritis is a disorder of the joints, that is characterized by progressive deterioration of the articular cartilage. As the disease progresses, pain, stiffness, and a limitation in movement may develop. Common sites of discomfort are the vertebrae, knees, and hips. The joints that bear much of the weight of the body. The pain from osteoarthritis is often relieved by rest. Resting the joint allows the inflammation to subside and prevent further damage. Simple heat and cold treatment can help the pain and stiffness in joints. Heat treatment is useful for joints which are stiff and immobile. Heat packs can be purchased at most drug stores or supermarkets. Be careful when using these for long periods of time, as they can cause burns. Cold treatment is useful for painful and inflamed joints. Once again, be careful when using these, as they can also cause burns. Simple painkillers can help with the pain of osteoarthritis, and are often first-line treatments. Always seek advice from a medical professional, as some painkillers can cause side effects such as stomach problems. Remember that as a first aider you are not allowed to give medication. You can only assist the patient to take their own. Sprains. It happens that a person stretches a muscle, ligament, or tendon beyond its capacity. The tissue under the skin has been damaged, and internal bleeding exists. A closed wound occurs under the skin. This is called a sprain. Common symptoms. The following symptoms could be present. Swelling at the joint. Sprains occur when, the ligaments surrounding a joint, are pulled beyond their normal range. Sprains are often accompanied, by bruising and swelling. Treatment. A cold compress for example an ice pack covered in a cloth must be put onto the injured part to control blood circulation. The injured part needs to be elevated to reduce blood flow and pressure in the body part. The body part must be immobilized with a stabilizing bandage. Dislocations. A dislocation is the displacement of bone ends at a joint. A joint is stabilized with ligaments and muscles, which can easily be torn during excessive movement. The joint can or cannot be deformed and may be mistaken for a fracture. Dislocations involve mostly the shoulder, elbow, finger, jaw, wrist, knee, or hip. Common symptoms. Pain and pressure at the joint. Loss of movement and possible deformity, swelling and discoloring. Treatment. Never attempt to replace or reposition a dislocated joint. Improvise support and comfort using padding or a pillow. Adhere to the basic principles of immobilization. Burns. Burns are classified in the seriousness, degrees, and types burns. Degrees of burns. First degree or superficial burn. The surface of the skin has been burned, and has changed color for example, sunburns. This type of burn usually heals in 5-6 to six days, without any permanent scarring. Common symptoms. The following symptoms would be present. No blisters. Skin has just been warmed. Skin is red, and dry. Painful. Burned area may also swell. Treatment. This type of burn is treated with cold water running over the surface of the skin for at least 20 minutes. No further treatment is necessary. Second degree burn or partial thickness burn. A second degree burn involves the top layers of skin. The dermis of the skin has been burned and has changed color and blisters have appeared. Common symptoms. The following symptoms could be present. The skin is red. Blisters that may open and weep clear fluid, giving the skin a wet appearance. The area may also appear mottled. The burn is usually painful, and often swells. Treatment. This type of burn, is also treated with cold water running over the surface of the skin, for at least 20 minutes. The burnt must be covered with sterile bandages. And the blister should not be broken. Seek medical assistance. With this type of burn. Treat for shock. Do not use fluffy dressings. On this burn wound. This type of burn usually heals in 3-4 to four weeks, and scarring may occur. 
Third degree burn or full thickness burn. A third degree burn destroys all layers of skin and any or all of the underlying structures, including fat, muscles, bones, and nerves. This burn is critical and requires immediate medical attention. Common symptoms The burn appears brown or black, with the tissues underneath, sometimes appearing white. Blisters appear around the burnt area. Extremely painful, or relatively painless if the burn destroys the nerve endings. Treatment. All clothing, or material sticking to the skin on the burn wound, should never be removed. Clothing, and material sticking to the wound, should rather be cut loose, and the burn covered with a wet cloth, or clean piece of plastic over the burnt area. The burn is then covered with sterile dressings, and cold running water poured over the dressing, to cool down the burn. Seek medical help. Treat for shock. Do not use fluffy dressing, on this burn wound. Types of burns. These are examples of causes of burns. Scalds are usually caused by, steam, hot foods, boiling cooking oil and water, etc. Dry burns are usually caused by, a fire, the sun, cigarette burn, etc. Chemical burns are usually caused by chemicals. Where a chemical reacts with water it should be removed first before being cooled with water. Electrical burns can have two burns, and can have effects on the heart. Thus ensure to monitor circulation and breathing. A chemical burn is the result of an acid or an alkali substance, touching the skin. Chemicals continue to burn, as long as they are in contact with skin. First aid is the same for all chemical burns. If a burn occurred at a workplace, send someone to check the safety data sheet, which includes first aid procedures for the specific chemical. Signs and symptoms of chemical burns include pain, burning, breathing difficulty, and eye pain or vision changes. Treatment is as follows. Brush the dry or powder chemical off skin, with gloved hands or cloth, before flushing with water. Flush the burn immediately with large amounts of cool running water, for at least 20 minutes. Clothing can be removed while flushing. Evacuate immediately. For a chemical in an eye, tip the head so that the affected eye is below nose, and wash the eye with warm water, from nose out to side of face, for at least 20 minutes. Even if an electrical burn appears small, major damage may have occurred inside the body. Most electrical burns that occur indoors, are caused by faulty electrical equipment, or careless use of electrical appliances. Turn off the electricity at the circuit breaker, the fuse box, or outside switch box. Unplug the appliance if plug is undamaged. Do not touch the appliance or person until current is off. Remember, the major damage occurs deep under the person's skin. Signs and symptoms of an electrical burn includes the following. A burn wound, which might appear small. Entrance and exit wounds. Multiple burns, and absent breathing or pulse. Once the area is safe, check the patient's breathing. Begin CPR if necessary. Evacuate to a safe place if the scene is unsafe. If the person fell, check for broken bones and treat as a possible spinal injury. Most electrical burns are third-degree burns, so cover all burn wounds with sterile dressings. Wounds. Wounds are classified as, open and closed wounds. Treatment of the casualty, and aseptic principles. Aseptic means, preventing infection. First aiders must comply with the aseptic principles, and only use sterile items. Sterile objects become unsterile, when touched by unsterile objects. The skin cannot be sterilized, and is unsterile. If the wound is not deep, and gapes slightly the first aider may find that, he or she, only needs to hold the wound edges together, dress, and bandage the wound. At times, however it may be difficult for the first aider to decide, whether a wound needs medical care. The first aider may ask the question. Does this wound need suturing by a medical practitioner? An open wound condition, requires medical treatment when the following occur. Blood spurting from a wound. Bleeding that persists despite, all efforts to control it. An incised wound, deeper than the outer layer of the skin. Crushed nerve, tendon, or muscle. Skin broken, bite human or animal. Foreign object, embedded deep in the tissue. Foreign matter in a wound, not possible to remove by washing. And any other open wound, where there is doubt about what to do. Open wounds. Open wounds occur where the skin's tissue has been damaged or torn. External bleeding takes place, and the bleeding has to be stopped, according to the treatment for external bleeding. 
the injured part, needs to be elevated, to reduce blood flow and pressure in the body part. The body part must be immobilized, with a stabilizing bandage. Foreign objects may be stuck in the patient's body, and should never be removed but, rather stabilized with a ring pad or stabilizing bandage. Examples of open wounds are incisions, lacerations, punctures, animal bites, contusions, abrasions, bruises, and ballistic wounds. Incisions, commonly called cuts, are wounds made by sharp cutting instruments such as knives, razors, and broken glass. Incisions tend to bleed freely, because the blood vessels are cut cleanly, and without ragged edges. There is little damage, to the surrounding tissues. Of all classes of wounds, incisions are the least likely to become infected, since the free flow of blood washes out many of the microorganisms or germs, that cause infection. Lacerations. These wounds are torn, rather than cut. They have ragged, irregular edges and masses of torn tissue underneath. These wounds are usually made by blunt, as opposed to sharp objects. A wound made by a dull knife, for instance, is more likely to be a laceration, than an incision. Bomb fragments often cause lacerations. Many of the wounds, caused by accidents with machinery or lacerations, they are often complicated, by crushing of the tissues as well. Lacerations are frequently contaminated with dirt, grease, or other material that is ground into the tissue. They are therefore, highly likely to become infected. Punctures, are caused by objects that penetrate into the tissues, while leaving a small surface opening. Wounds made by nails, needles, wire, and bullets are usually punctures. As a rule, small puncture wounds do not bleed freely, however, large puncture wounds may cause severe internal bleeding. The possibility, of infection is great in all puncture wounds, especially if the penetrating object, has tetanus bacteria on it. To prevent anaerobic infections, primary closures are not made in the case of puncture wounds. Abrasions, are made when the skin is rubbed or scraped off. Rope burns, floor burns, and skin knees or elbows, are common examples of abrasions. This kind of wound, can become infected quite easily, because dirt and germs are usually embedded in the tissues. Contusion. This wound is normally caused by a blunt object, which bruises the surrounding tissues, and could cause a fracture. Bite wound. This wound is normally caused by animal bites for example, dog or cat. Try to keep the animal that caused the bite, for further tests. Ballistic wounds. A bullet. Or a projectile caused this wound. Damage normally caused internally. Amputations. An amputation is the tearing away of tissue, from a body part. Bleeding is usually heavy. In certain situations, the torn tissue may be surgically reattached. It can be saved for medical evaluation, by wrapping it in a sterile dressing. And placing it in a cool container and rushing it, along with the victim, to a medical facility. Do not, allow the amputated portion to freeze, and do not immerse it in water or saline. Closed wound. A closed wound occurs under the skin. The tissue under the skin has been damaged, and internal bleeding exists. A cold compress for example, ice pack covered in a cloth, must be put onto the injured part, to control blood circulation. The injured part needs to be elevated, to reduce blood flow and pressure in the body part. The body part must be immobilized with a stabilizing bandage. Examples of closed wounds are muscle strains and joint sprains. Cuts. Cuts or open wounds, are a result of damage to the tissue, which causes slight, or severe bleeding depending, on the degree of the injury and the rate of blood lost. Common symptoms. The following symptoms would be present. Restlessness and anxiety. Progress of shock. Pale, cold, and clammy skin. Rapid pulse becoming weaker. Faintness and dizziness. And. Shallow breathing, yawning, gasping for air. Treatment. Wash your hands. Press the wound with thumb and fingers, holding cut edges together if necessary, until bleeding stops. Rinse wound under a tap if it is dirty. Then, using gauze, gently clean with soap and water. Work from the center of the wound outwards, using a clean swab for each wipe. Finish with some diluted antiseptic. Pat skin thoroughly dry. Carefully remove any small pieces of glass, or gravel from the wound with a clean piece of gauze tweezers. For small cuts and grazes, a plaster is enough. Larger injuries need a non-adhesive dressing, secured with a gauze bandage, which you tie firmly, but not so tightly that the circulation is restricted. 
Never put fluffy dressings like cotton wool next to the wound. They will stick to it, and it will be painful when it comes to pulling it off. Only handle the very edges of a dressing. Embedded objects should be stabilized to prevent internal damage. Remove slivers, also known as splinters, with tweezers. You may need to use a sterile needle, to tease the sliver into a better position for removal. Wash the area with soap and water, and apply antibiotic ointment, before applying an adhesive bandage. Large objects, such as a knife, a pencil, or steel rod, must not be removed or moved. Stabilize the object with bulky dressings, or padding placed around base of object, to keep it from moving. If the wound is bleeding, apply direct pressure around base of object. Do not apply pressure on the object, or on the skin next to sharp edges of object. If necessary, reduce the length or the weight of object, by cutting or breaking it. Call for medical assistance. In the case of an impaled object in cheek, examine the injury inside mouth. If the object extends through the cheek, and you are more than one hour from medical help, consider removing the object. To remove object, place two fingers next to object, straddling it. Gently pull it in the direction from which it entered. If it cannot be removed easily, leave it in place. Secure it with bulky dressings to control the bleeding. After removing object, place dressings over the wound inside mouth, between the cheek and teeth. This will help control the bleeding, and will not interfere with person's airway. Also, place a dressing on outside wound. Make sure to get medical assistance. If the impaled object is in the eye, do not exert pressure on the eyeball. This may cause fluid to leak out. Stabilize the object. For long, protruding objects, use a bulky dressing or clean cloth. Place a paper cup or cone over the eye, to prevent bumping. For short objects, surround the eye with a donut-shaped pad. Hold it in place with a roller bandage. Cover the undamaged eye. This prevents sympathetic movements of injured eye. Explain to the patient what you are doing, and reassure them, as they will not be able to see with both eyes covered. Get medical assistance as soon as possible. Bleeding. Bleeding is categorized in two categories, namely external bleeding, and internal bleeding. Whenever bleeding must be stopped, surgical gloves need to be worn for protection. The amount of blood, in an adult's body is determined by his size, and weight. An approved method, to determine the amount of blood in a person's body, is by dividing his body weight by 10. The answer indicates more, or less the amount of blood in that person's body in liters. For example, 76 kg divided by 10 equals 7, 6 liters. The person's life is in serious danger, when quarter of the blood volume is lost. External bleeding. Note, bleeding must be controlled, so that the body can stop the bleeding. Bandages, and dressings only minimize bleeding, and prevent infection. External bleeding is caused by wounds, and is classified as Arterial bleeding. The artery, transporting blood from the heart is damaged. The blood is bright red in color, and is lost from the body, in a squirting action. The best way to stop such bleeding, is by applying direct pressure on a pressure point, between the injury, and the heart with the hand. A pressure pad, and bandage may also be used. Venous bleeding. The vein, transporting the blood back to the heart, is damaged. The blood is dark red in color, and is lost in a flowing out action, from the body. The best way to stop such bleeding, is by applying direct pressure to the wound, with clean cloths, and bandages. Capillary bleeding. Blood, seeps from a superficial wound, and is bright red in color. The best way to stop such bleeding, is by applying direct pressure onto the wound, with clean cloths and bandages. Treatment for external bleeding. If cavities are involved. Apply wound dressing with moderate pressure. Localize the bleeding, for example position the patient. Treat for shock. If extremities are involved. Direct pressure. Elevate if possible. Pressure point. Treat for shock. In most cases, the average person may find, they are not prepared and unable to administer the best first aid possible, because they lack the knowledge, of various types of dressing and bandage materials available, or the proper use of these important first aid items. A dressing is used to cover a wound, to assist with control of further bleeding, and prevention of further contamination.
there are three types of dressings that should be part of any first aid kit, namely adhesive, pressure, and gauze dressings. The purpose of a dressing is to control bleeding, prevent infection, absorb blood and wound drainage, and to protect the wound from further injury. Types of dressings include pads, sterile eye pads, sterile gauze pads, sterile non-adherent pads and burn dressings. A burn dressing is a sterile pad soaked in a cooling gel. Always make sure that the pads you are using are sterile, or as clean as possible, as they are applied directly to the wound. The dressing should also be absorbent, to soak up body fluids such as blood or any discharge. The dressing must be soft and compressible, so pressure can be distributed over the wound. Always make sure the dressing is non-fluffy, so the material will not stick to the wound. Please do not use cotton wool directly on a wound. There are different types of bandages. Their sterility is not necessary, as they are used to secure a dressing. They should however be as clean as possible. Gauze roller bandages are absorbent, breathable, and often elastic. Elastic bandages are used for sprains, and as pressure bandages. Adhesive, elastic roller bandages are highly effective pressure bandages and durable, waterproof bandaging. Triangular bandages are used as slings, tourniquets, to tie splints, and many other uses. The most used type of bandage is the gauze bandage. It is a simple woven strip of material, which can come in any number of widths and lengths. A gauze bandage can be used for any bandage application, including holding a dressing in place. A triangular bandage is a piece of cloth, cut into a right-angled triangle. This is felt by many trainers to be the most versatile of the bandages available, as it can be used fully unrolled as a sling, folded as a normal bandage, or for specialist bandages such as on the head. Sometimes dressings and bandages are combined, in which case they must be sterile. Adhesive bandages like band-aids and sticking plasters, are of the most used items in a first aid kit. Examples are straight adhesive bandages, and butterfly, or knuckle bandages. The main types of bandages are triangular, and roller bandages. They are used to secure the dressing and assist in control of bleeding. Provide support to a limb or joint. Hold splints in place and immobilize parts of the body. If a bandage is applied, it should cover the whole dressing and do not remove the bandage once it is in place. If it becomes saturated with blood, apply another one on top, so that clotting that has already taken place, will not be disturbed. There should always be a pulse distal to the side of the bandage. Where possible, keep the nail beds uncovered, to enable detection of inadequate distal circulation. Should signs of inadequate distal circulation be visible, as observed from skin temperature and color, loosen the bandage, and reapply. An occlusive dressing is an airtight dressing, that can be used to treat a sucking chest wound, in which air is sucked into the chest cavity, collapsing the lung. This is known as a pneumothorax. For this use, an occlusive dressing should be taped on three sides only, to create a one-way valve. Petroleum gauze, also used as non-adherent dressing can be used as an occlusive dressing, as well as half of any gauze wrapper, since the inside is sterile and airtight. Internal bleeding. Internal bleeding, can usually not be seen, and a patient can bleed themselves to death, without spilling one drop of blood. Internal bleeding can however be seen when blood flows from inside of the ear, from the lungs and abdomen, intestines, and bladder. The patient will be cold, clammy, very weak, pale, and dizzy, have a rapid pulse, breathe rapidly, and will complain of pain in the injured area. The patient must be laid down, feet elevated not more than 20 centimeters, and are covered with a blanket. Bleeding from inside the ear, should never be stopped. Look out for or find out. History of injury, that caused internal bleeding. History of a medical condition, for example, ulcer, which may cause internal bleeding. Pain, and tenderness around the affected area. Swelling, and or bruises. Signs and symptoms of shock. Blood may appear, from one of the body's orifices. Blood speckled froth, at the mouth. Treatment for internal bleeding. Cavities. Localize the bleeding, for example, position the patient. Treat for shock. Extremities. Apply ice indirectly. Elevate if possible. Treat for shock. Nosebleeds. A nosebleed occurs when blood vessels inside the nose break. Because they are delicate, this can happen easily. Treatment for nosebleeds. Let the casualty sit down. 
Do not let the casualty tilt their head backwards. Do not plug the nose. Advise the casualty to breathe through the mouth, and to pinch the soft part of the nose. Tell the casualty not to swallow any blood, but to spit it out, because it may cause nausea and vomiting. Press an ice pack against the bridge. After plus minus 10 minutes, leave the nose to see if the bleeding has stopped. If not repeat treatment for another 10 minutes. If the bleeding has stopped, tell the casualty to avoid exertion and not to blow their nose. If the bleeding has stopped keep the head forward, and clean the casualty's face. What not to do? Tilt your head back. The injured person may swallow blood, and potentially some could go in their lungs. The patient may also start to vomit, as the blood will irritate the stomach. When to seek medical attention. Call the doctor if you cannot stop the bleeding after 30 minutes. If the nosebleed happens without a reason, or if the bleeding accompanies a headache, dizziness, ringing in the ears, or vision problems. Bleeding from the ear. Treatment for bleeding from the ear. Put the casualty in a half-sitting position with the head towards the injured side, so that any fluid can drain from the ear. Do not plug the ear. Cover the ear with a sterile dressing. Check pulse and breathing rate. Treat for shock. If the casualty becomes unconscious, but is still breathing normally, put him in the recovery position. If breathing and heartbeat stops, begin resuscitation and seek medical help. Bleeding scalp. First aid for a bleeding scalp. Control the bleeding using direct pressure. If the casualty is conscious lay them down, with the head and shoulders slightly raised. Check casualty's vital signs at 10 minute intervals. If the casualty becomes unconscious, place them in the recovery position. If breathing and heartbeat stops, begin resuscitation. Transport to hospital. An allergy is a hypersensitivity reaction by the body, to foreign substances, called antigens, that in similar amounts and circumstances, are harmless within the bodies of other people. Antigens that provoke an allergic reaction are called allergens. Typical allergens include pollens, drugs, lints, bacteria, foods, and dyes or chemicals. Allergic reactions include hay fever, insect venom allergy, asthma and contact dermatitis, which is a skin disorder. Allergic reactions can be mild and recurrent, for example hay fever, hives, and mild asthma, or sudden and severe, seen by asthmatic attacks and anaphylaxis. When an allergen comes in contact with the body, the immune system produces and releases histamines, in an attempt to eliminate it. This results in an allergic reaction. Most allergic reactions can typically be treated with an antihistamine. Allergic rhinitis affects the nose, sinuses, and the eyes. Hay fever is caused by wind-borne pollen, and occurs only at certain seasons of the year. Perennial rhinitis, on the other hand, is due to substances present year-round, such as house dust, mites, feathers, animal dander, or molds. Signs and symptoms of allergic rhinitis include frequent sneezing, a stuffy, runny nose, red, itchy eyes, runny eyes, profuse nasal discharge, nasal congestion, possible cough or wheezing, impaired sense of smell, and itching in back of throat. The best treatment is to avoid the cause of the reaction if known. Advise the casualty to visit a medical practitioner if symptoms persist. Hives can result from an allergy to a drug, insect sting or bite, or food. Food allergies can particularly be eggs, nuts, fruit, and seafood. Signs and symptoms of hives can be seen as a pink, blotchy, and itchy bumps on the skin, ranging from less than a quarter of an inch, to several inches in diameter. Occasionally massive, itchy swelling of a lip, an eyelid, a hand, or a foot can be present. Always be prepared for anaphylaxis, and treat accordingly. You can assist the patient to take their own prescribed antihistamines, if available. Anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction, that overwhelms the body systems with potentially fatal results. Signs and symptoms include the following. Shortness of breath. Swelling of the tongue, mouth, and nose. Intense itching, flushed skin, or swollen face. Sneezing coughing, wheezing, as well as tightness and swelling in the throat and chest. Increased heart rate and blue discoloration around lips and mouth. Dizziness, and a history of previous severe allergic reactions. Most patients will wear a medical identification tag. Treatment include monitoring breathing. If the person has his or her own physician prescribed epinephrine auto-injector, help the person administer it. Find the injection site on the outer mid-thigh. Remove the safety cap. Push the auto-injector against the outer mid-thigh. Hold in place for 10 seconds. 
pull the auto injector straight out from the leg. Rub the area for 10 seconds and call the emergency services or take the patient to a medical center immediately. Insect bites and stings. Common symptoms. For most people, insect bites or stings cause only a painful swelling with redness and itching. A bee and wasp sting, however, may cause a severe allergic reaction in some people. Look for skin eruptions, swelling around the eyes and mouth, nausea and vomiting, and breathing difficulties. When these signs occur, seek medical help immediately. Treatment. Ask the person if they have medication, that they take for such a reaction, and help them to take the prescribed medication, if it is available. Apply ass wrapped in cloth. When the stinger remains in the skin, remove it by carefully scraping it, and its attached poison sac from the skin. Do not use tweezers, or anything that may squeeze more poison into the body. If there is swelling in the mouth, or if there is difficulty breathing, watch the person closely. Place him in the recovery position, or any position that makes his or her breathe easier. Seek medical attention immediately. Most spiders are venomous, but most lack long fangs and strong jaws to bite a human. Signs and symptom of a black widow spider include the following. Sharp pinprick sensation, followed by dull, numbing pain. Two small fang marks seen as tiny red spots. The patient will experience severe abdominal pain. Bites on an arm can produce severe chest pain, thus mimicking a heart attack. Headache, chills, fever, heavy sweating, nausea, and vomiting are common. Treatment include cleaning the bite mark with soap and water. Apply an ice pack to the area, and take the casualty to a medical facility immediately. If facial swelling or anaphylaxis occurs, treat appropriately. Signs and symptoms of a brown recluse spider, also known as a fiddleback and violin spider, include mild to severe pain, that occurs within 2 to 8 hours. A blister develops within 48 to 72 hours, and becomes red and bursts. It will take on a bullseye appearance. Fever, weakness, vomiting, joint pain, and a rash are common. Treat the bite the same as you would a black widow spider bite. If the wound becomes infected, apply antibiotic ointment under a sterile dressing. Take the casualty to a medical facility immediately. The signs and symptoms for a common aggressive house spider, also known as the hobo spider, are the same as for brown recluse spider. Treat the bite the same as you would a brown recluse spider bite. Signs and symptoms of tarantulas, varies from mild to severe throbbing pain, that lasts up to one hour. Treat the bite the same as a black widow spider bite. For hairs in the skin, remove it with sticky tape, then wash with soap and water. Symptoms from a scorpion sting begin from within minutes to half an hour, reach their height within the first few hours, and usually last from 6 to 24 hours. There is a local, immediate pain and burning around the sting site. Numbness or tingling occurs later. Severely affected people will experience pain along the stung arm or leg, or even paralysis. Uncontrolled jerking movements of the legs or arms, and facial twitching. They will also have a fast heart rate, salivation will occur, with breathing distress. Treatment include monitoring breathing, gently cleaning the sting site with soap and water. Apply an ice pack over the sting site, to reduce pain and venom absorption. Apply dressings and evacuate for severe reactions in children. Poisoning. A poison is any substance that can cause illness, or death when it is absorbed into the body. An antidote is a substance, that acts against a poison, to offset its effects. You will need as much history about a poisoning accident as possible, so that proper first aid can be started without delay. Poisons enter the body in four ways. Inhalation, through breathing. Injection, by puncture into skin. Absorption, through skin. Ingestion, swallowing. General signs and symptoms of poisoning. Distinctive smell of poisons, evidence of containers. The nervous system may be affected causing slurred speech and, or drooling, impaired vision, uncontrolled muscle spasms, loss of balance, or paralysis. Shock may develop within minutes, hours or even days. Level of consciousness will deteriorate for example, dizziness, unconsciousness. Breathing may be affected. Difficult due to swelling, gurgling due to excessive saliva or fluids on the lungs. And the skin becomes cold, clammy. Treatment safety first. Gather information from the patient, bystanders, family, or the environment and try to identify the substance. Check the circulation airway and breathing, if necessary and manage according to the assessment. Contact the nearest poison center in, or emergency medical service. Manage shock. 
Common symptoms. If the history does not reveal what poison was taken, or by what means it was taken, the signs and symptoms may be helpful, in determining how the poison was taken. The patient could have the following symptoms. When taken by mouth. Nausea. Abdominal cramps, and vomiting. Discolor the lips. And. Cause burns in the mouth, or leave an odor on the breath. One absorbed through the skin. Reddening of the skin. May affect consciousness. Breathing. And. Pulse irregularities. When injected through the skin. Irritates the point of entry. Affect consciousness. Breathing. And. Pulse irregularities. When inhaled. Respiratory problems. Consciousness. Pulse irregularities. Coughing. Chest pain. And. Headache. Treatment. Call a Poison Information Center at Johannesburg 0116422417, or Cape Town 0216895227, or a doctor, and follow their advice. Swallowed poison should not be diluted. Wipe and remove any poison, or corrosive residue from the person's mouth, and do not induce vomiting, unless on advice from the Poison Information Center. Inhaled poison such as gases should be cleared from the lungs, as soon as possible and, the person removed to fresh air. If breathing stops continue with artificial resuscitation. Absorbed poison such as liquid, or powered chemicals must be removed from the skin, as quickly as possible by flushing the affected area with lukewarm water, and then washing the skin with soap and water. Injected poison should be contained near the injection site. Keep the casualty at rest, and the affected limb at below heart level to delay absorption. Snakebite. The vast majority of snakes, are not poisonous. Most of South Africa's snake-related attacks are under teenagers and younger children because teenagers and children catch the snakes to be kept as pets. Only a small percentage of snake bites are dangerous, but you should consider all bites as dangerous. Make sure to obtain and record all information. In most cases, the snake strikes swiftly and injects venom below the surface of the skin into the tissues, which is then absorbed by the lymphatic system. Should you see a snake, leave IT alone, do not attempt to kill it, as the creature will defend itself vigorously. Stay clear of likely habitats, and always pay special attention to young children playing near long grass and bush. Research suggests that only around 15% of people struck by poisonous snakes are envenomed, but always treat for the worst case, and assume that venom has been injected. Common Symptoms A non-spitting cobra, mamba, and wrinkle spite need urgent first aid treatment. Their venom generally affects the nervous system and can affect breathing. The adder and spitting cobra snake venom usually cause severe local tissue damage, with loss of tissue fluid resulting in shock. The boomslang and vine snake venom affects blood clotting and may result in spontaneous bleeding. In all cases the first aid treatment should be to restrict circulation and prevent the venom to circulation to the heart and brain. Puncture marks. Parallel scratches on the skin, rarely any pain. Anxiety. Pale, cool skin with progressive onset of sweating. Rapid, weak pulse. Rapid, shallow breathing. Breathing difficulties. Blurred vision, drooping eyelids. Difficulty swallowing and speaking. Abdominal pain. Nausea and or vomiting. Headache. And. Collapse, progressing to a comatose state. Treatment as per Tigerberg Poison Information Center. Before leaving on a hike, climbing, mountain biking or camping trip, find out where the nearest medical facility is, and note the telephone number. In the case of a snake bite, get the patient to a medical facility as soon as possible. Phone ahead to notify them, of the arrival of a snake bite victim. Note that, in most cases, you have a couple of hours before, serious life-threatening symptoms manifest themselves. Immobilize the patient if possible. If alone, keep calm and do not walk too fast, or run as this speed up, the distribution of the venom. Do not suck the bite site. Do not apply a tourniquet. Only in suspected neurotoxic bites, for example the mamba, cape cobra bites, is it recommended that you apply a wide crepe bandage firmly above the bite site, as tightly as for a sprained ankle, to slow the spread of venom to vital organs like the heart and lungs. The life-threatening neurotoxic effects of mamba and cape cobra bites, such as difficulty in breathing develop within 30 minutes to 4 hours. If you are more than 2 hours away from medical assistance, Respiratory support for example, mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, may be necessary. 
The life-threatening effects of a cytotoxic snake bite for example, puff adder develop late it may take 6 to 24 hours. Comforting and reassuring the patient is an especially important part of the first aid treatment. Try to get a good description of the snake. Note. Antivenom should only be administered by the trained medical staff in a medical facility. Symptoms of food poisoning starts a few hours or days after the contaminated food has been ingested. Headache, nausea and vomiting, stomach ache, and diarrhea are common. Common symptoms of poisonous plants and mushrooms include excessive saliva, very thirsty and excessive perspiration. The patient can experience palpitations and even cardiac arrest. Altered level of consciousness, hallucinations, and convulsions are common. Do not induce vomiting, unless ordered by a doctor at a poison center. Continue with general management of poisoning. Infection of the urinary tract is a common and important, because of both minor and major illness. At one extreme, an attack of cystitis, which is inflammation of the bladder, may cause only trivial discomfort. On the other hand, infection once established, may cause lifelong discomfort, may be largely unresponsive to treatment, and may greatly shorten life itself. Because of the short female urethra, urinary infections are more common in women than in men, and occur especially during pregnancies, when there may be partial stagnation of the urine from pressure on the urinary tract. In later life, as prostatic disease becomes more common, urinary infection becomes more of a problem in men. In all forms of urinary infection, the urine may be cloudy, and may contain more ammonia than usual. Urination tends to be painful if the urethra is inflamed, and both painful and frequent if inflammation involves the bladder. Bladder infection may also cause fever, dull pain in the lower part of the abdomen, and vomiting. If the infection reaches the kidneys, symptoms are even more severe, and there is pain in the loins, on one or both sides, and sometimes high fever. Advise the patient to consult a doctor, if they have pain while urinating or cannot urinate. Encourage drinking lots of water and other fluids. A sexually transmitted disease is any disease, such as syphilis, gonorrhea, AIDS, or a genital form of herpes simplex, that is usually or often transmitted from person to person, by direct sexual contact. It may also be transmitted from a mother to her child, before or at birth or, less frequently, may be passed from person to person in non-sexual contact, such as in kissing, in tainted blood transfusions, or in the use of unsanitized hypodermic syringes. Sexually transmitted diseases usually affect initially the genitals, the reproductive tract, the urinary tract, the oral cavity, the anus, or the rectum, but may mature in the body to attack various organs and systems. Tertiary syphilis, or paresis, for example, may affect skin, bones, the central nervous system, the heart, the liver, or other organs. Persons infected by an AIDS virus may remain outwardly healthy for years, before the disease takes hold within the immune system, or, often, the disease may never arise at all. Gonorrhea is a sexually transmitted disease, characterized principally by inflammation of the mucous membranes, of the genital tract and urethra. The incubation period of gonorrhea is usually 3 to 5 days, with a range of 2 to 10 days. The first symptoms in men are a burning sensation upon urination, and a purulent urethral discharge that may be profuse, or may be so meager as to go unnoticed. In the absence of treatment, the infection usually extends deeper, to involve the upper urethra, the neck of the urinary bladder, and the prostate gland. Urgency and frequency of urination and, occasionally, blood in the urine may follow. The initial symptoms in women are, in most instances, so mild as to go unnoticed. Slight vaginal discharge with burning may occur. The causative organism of venereal syphilis is a slender, coiled, flexible bacterium with regular, tightly wound coils. This bacterium, averages 8 to 10 microns in length. The bacterium requires moisture to exist, so continuous moisture is a necessity for the transfer of the microorganism, from one person to another. The most common means of such transfer is sexual intercourse. In the body's tissues, the spirochete bacteria reproduce and remain present for the lifetime of the infected person, unless destroyed by treatment. Syphilis is effectively treated with penicillin, which kills the spirochetes. Herpes infections are significant, not only in terms of the discomfort they cause, but also for the potentially serious illness that might occur in infants born to mothers with genital herpes infections. A variety of treatments have been used for genital herpes, but none have been entirely satisfactory. Genital herpes is an infection of the genitalia, caused by herpes simplex virus. 
The virus is highly contagious, and may be transmitted by individuals who are lifelong carriers, but who remain asymptomatic, and may not even know they are infected. Infections are most often acquired through direct genital contact. The incubation period for herpes simplex infection is usually 4 to 5 days, but may be as short as 24 hours, or as long as 2 weeks. The first symptoms may be pain or itching at the site of infection. This is followed within a day or two by the appearance of blister-like lesions, that may occur singly or in groups. In males the common sites of infection include the foreskin, the glands, and the shaft of the penis. In females the blister may occur on the labia, the clitoris, the opening of the vagina, or, occasionally, the uterine cervix. Within a few days the blisters rupture, and merge to form large areas of denuded tissue surrounded by swollen, inflamed skin. At this stage, the lesions may become acutely painful, with intense burning and irritation. In females especially, urination may cause great discomfort. Generalized symptoms such as fever and malaise may develop, and lymph nodes in the groin may enlarge. Lesions may persist in this stage for a week or more, and complete healing may take four to six weeks. A variety of treatments have been used for genital herpes, but none is entirely satisfactory. Drying agents such as alcohol, spirits of camphor, and ether have been used. Other methods of treatment include the use of ointments and creams, topical anesthetics, and antiseptic solutions. Antiviral agents may be effective in diminishing the duration of symptoms, and the period of time during which the virus may be recovered from the lesions. It is effective only before the latency state is established. During latency, when the virus lives in tissues without causing symptoms, it is protected against destruction. In people with frequent, severe recurrences, daily low-dose antiviral therapy can decrease the number of outbreaks. AIDS can be described as a condition, which develops when the body's defense mechanism, also known as the immune system, is not working properly. As a result, the victim of AIDS is more likely to get illnesses, which his or her body would normally have been able to fight off easily. What basically happens, is that the AIDS virus attacks the body's immune system. I. We know that the body is made up of millions of cells. There are many different types of cells, each with its own function. The function of the white blood cells and their controlling cells, the T helper cells, is to defend the body from harmful bacterial, viral, fungal, and parasitic germs, which causes disease. They do this in different ways. Some white blood cells attack and destroy the harmful germs. Other white blood cells produce antibodies, which grab the harmful germs and render them harmless, or bind them so that other white blood cells can attack and destroy them. This internal defense system of the body, which protects it from disease and infection, is known as the immune system. A virus is a tiny agent, or particle, which can only reproduce inside a living cell. AIDS is caused when the human immune deficiency virus, known as HIV, attacks the white blood cells, which normally protect the body against disease and infection. As the HIV virus multiplies, more white blood cells are rendered useless. This results in immune deficiency, a situation in which the body's defense system against disease, does not work properly. The HIV virus itself does not kill. It makes way for other life-threatening diseases. It must be said, however, that the HIV virus is slow-growing, and may remain dormant for up to six and a half years, before it reproduces in the body, or before the carrier of the virus shows any symptoms. The human immune deficiency virus, which is the cause of AIDS, is found only in body fluids, namely blood, semen, vaginal secretions, breast milk, saliva, tears, bone marrow, and amniotic fluid. The blood, semen, and vaginal secretions, however, are high in concentration. This virus can, therefore, only be transmitted from one person to another, by means of body fluids and in the following ways. An infected person can pass it on to an uninfected person, through sexual intercourse and anal sex, or oral sex. It can be passed from male to male, male to female and female to male participants. HIV can also be transmitted through exposure to infected blood, for example, sharing needles and syringes, razor blades, toothbrushes, and blood transfusions. Although the latter is very unlikely, since all donated blood and blood products are tested and treated with heat. HIV may be passed on from an infected mother to her child during pregnancy, birth, or breastfeeding. It may be transmitted via the transplanting of body organs or tissues, and the transfer of semen from HIV-infected donors. Casual contacts such as sharing toilets and eating or drinking utensils, using the same swimming pool, casual body contact like holding hands, 
does not transmit HIV. It is only transmittable via infected body fluids. The risk of being infected by HIV can either be high or low, depending on the person, his habits and situation in which he is present. For example, involvement in an accident, either as a helper or a victim, can expose a person to HIV infection, though the risk is low, because accidents do not afflict or involve that person every day. People in the medical profession, are at high risk, because of the nature of their work. Human behaviors, such as sex and drug abuse, are high transmission risks, due to their regular and widespread practice. People are exceptionally vulnerable to HIV infection through the following high-risk behaviors. Anal sex is the highest risk practice whether a condom is worn or not. Engaging in sex with many different partners, or with someone who has many partners, is also an extremely high-risk practice. Engaging in sex without a condom, with someone whose sexual history you do not know. Vaginal or oral sex with someone who practices anal sex, or who injects drugs. Sharing needles and syringes, razors, and toothbrushes, is also a high risk. Other sexually transmitted diseases like gonorrhea and syphilis, increase the chance of the infected person catching the HIV virus, due to the presence of ulcers and open sores on the genitals. Because there is no cure, or vaccine for AIDS, the emphasis at the moment lies in the prevention of transmission of the HIV virus, from one person to another. People's sexual habits are the chief cause of the HIV virus quick spread, and it has now become necessary for them to reassess and adjust these habits, in order to prevent the spread of the virus. They should stick to one partner, if they do not know their partner, they should use a condom. They should stick to someone who does not have many sexual partners, and who do not share needles and syringes to inject drugs. They should stick to someone who is not infected with HIV, and not engage in sexual activities if they are infected with HIV. Other preventative measures are the following. People should go for regular medical checkups. They should not share needles, syringes, razors, or toothbrushes. They should wear some form of protection, when working with accident victims. They should use recommended sterilization methods, with objects that are contaminated with blood. We have already mentioned that unsafe sexual habits pose a high HIV transmission risk. Unsafe sexual acts also heighten this risk. Some unsafe sexual acts are oral, vaginal, and anal intercourse without using a condom. Oral sex carried out to climax. Sharing sex toys, and rubbing semen onto the penis or broken skin. To reduce the risk of transmitting the HIV virus, it is best to safe practices during sexual intimacy. These safe sexual practices are Body, 2. Body rubbing. Masturbating alone, or together. Massage, hugging and cuddling. Dry kissing, and clean sex toys that are shared. Six rubber condoms, are the best to use for the protection against HIV infection, because, unlike the natural membrane condoms, they do not have pores in the material. An additional precaution against the HIV infection, is to use condoms with spermicide. Spermicide protects the user by killing the actual virus, and is most effective when smeared on the tip and the outside of the condom. In order for condoms to act effectively, they should be used correctly. Condoms with spermicide, can lose their efficiency over a long period, and the user therefore checks the expiry date before use. The condom's teeth should be squeezed, as the condom is rolled down the length of the erect penis. After climax, the user should withdraw, holding the condom in place as he does so. Condoms must be used only once and then discarded. Condoms are safer when they are used with a lubricant, but do not use Vaseline, as this causes the condom to break. Only water-based lubricants should be used, such as K-Jelly, which is available from most pharmacies. At some time in the future, you may be called on to assist with the birth of a baby. This activity is a most rewarding one for a first aid provider, and there is no need to be frightened or nervous about it. The mother requires support and reassurance, more than anything else, and if you appear calm and confident, this will show her that you are someone to rely on. Remember, that women have been performing the function of childbirth for a long time, and the process is natural. You are there to provide any help that may be required, during a process that is controlled by the mother. Your active intervention is necessary only in extreme situations. Childbirth is open to infection. It is imperative that you take all possible precautions for mother and child, against infection from yourself, and from the surroundings. Ensure that you wear gloves during the process. If gloves are unavailable, ensure that you scrub your hands thoroughly with soap and warm water. Change your gloves, or scrub your hands each time they come in contact with contaminated material, like feces and blood. Childbirth occurs in three stages, namely. 
Stage 1, the onset of labor. Stage 2, the birth of the baby. And Stage 3, the delivery of the afterbirth. The first stage. In this early part of labor, it is often helpful for the mother to keep occupied, as long as she does not get too tired. She should be patient and calm, relaxing as the contractions come and go, and breathing slowly and deeply during the contractions, as they become strong. Emptying the bowels and frequent urination, will help to relieve discomfort. The mother will know she is in true labor, if she has regular contractions of the womb, which are prolonged and become strong, and closer together. When she knows the baby is on the way, she should choose a place to have the baby, that will be clean and peaceful. She should be able to lie down, or sit in a leaning position, with her back well supported. The following events occur, as part of the first stage of labor and delivery. The state of dilation. The first signs may be noticeable only to the mother, like low backache and irregular cramping pains, known as contractions, in the lower abdomen. As labor progresses, the contractions become stronger, last longer, and become more regular. When the contractions recur at regular 3-4 to four minute intervals, and last from 50-60 to 60 seconds, the mother is in the latter part of the first stage. The contractions will get stronger and more frequent. The mother will often make an involuntary, deep grunting moan with each contraction. The delivery of the baby is now imminent. What to do during the first stage? Those helping the mother, should know how to time the contractions. This information will give them an idea, as to how far into labor the mother is, and how much time remains until the baby comes. Place a hand on the mother's abdomen, just above the umbilicus. As contractions begin, you will feel a hardening ball. Time the interval from the moment the uterus begins to harden, until it completely relaxes. Time the intervals in minutes, between the start of one contraction and the start of the next contraction. As labor progresses, this time will decrease. Walking or standing tends to shorten labor, so if that feels comfortable to the mother, let her. Also, if she becomes hungry or thirsty, let her eat or drink small amounts of food fruit juice, or suck on ice chips. Attending to the mother. Make no attempt to wipe away vaginal secretions, as this may contaminate the birth canal. The bag of water may rupture during this stage of labor, and blood-tinged mucus may appear. At the end of the first stage, the mother may feel tired, discouraged, and irritable. This is often referred to as transition, and is the most uncomfortable part of labor, and such feelings are perfectly normal. The mother may have a backache, may vomit, and may feel either hot or cold, or both at the same time. She may tremble, feel panicky or scared cry, or get very cross with her husband and birthing attendants. She may even announce that she has changed her mind, and is not going with it. At this time, she needs plenty of encouragement, and assurance that things are proceeding normally, and that her feelings are normal. Birth attendants, the husband, and others present at the labor and birth should have a cheerful, calm appearance. Nervousness, panic, or distressing remarks, can have an inhibiting effect on a laboring woman. Comments on how long the labor is lasting, how pale or tired the woman looks, can have a terrible effect on her morale. Even talking quietly can irritate a woman having an intense contraction, because it is hard to concentrate on relaxing when there is noise in the room. Relaxation is especially important. A woman's husband or labor coach, should instruct her to go limp like a rag doll, and breathe deeply, making her tummy rise and fall. This is called abdominal breathing. Begin each contraction with a deep breath, to keep the tissues of both mom and baby, oxygenated. Observe the kind of breathing you do, when you are nearly asleep and try to simulate it. Help her to relax her hands, face and legs, if you see that they are tense. Tenseness in the body fights the contractions, and intensifies the sensations of pain. Relaxation helps a woman to handle the contractions easier, and have a faster labor. Sometimes a woman will breathe too fast, and get tingling sensations in her hands and feet. She needs to be coached to slow down her breathing. You can have her follow your breathing, until the tingling goes away. Firm hand pressure on the lower back, by those attending the mother, may help to relieve the back ache. Alternately, the mother may prefer to lean her back against a firm surface. Deep rhythmical breathing, helps to relieve annoying symptoms. The discomfort seldom lasts for more than a dozen contractions. When the womb is almost fully opened, the baby will soon enter the birth canal, and there will be a vocalized catch in the mother's breathing, when she has a contraction. This will signal the onset of the second stage. Stage 2, the birth of the baby. The contractions of the second stage, are often of a different kind. They may come further apart, and the mother usually fells inclined to bear down, and push with them. When she gets this feeling, she should take a deep breath as each contraction comes, hold her breath and gently push. 
There is no hurry here. The mother should feel no need, to exert great force as she pushes. She may want to push with several breaths, during each contraction. After it passes, a deep sigh will help her recover her breath. She should then rest until the next contraction. She may even sleep between contractions. Some general instructions for the second stage of labor. Be calm. Reassure the mother, and be prepared to administer first aid, to both the mother and baby. It includes possible respiratory and cardiac resuscitation for the baby, and hemorrhage control, and prevention of shock, for the mother may be needed. Discourage onlookers, from crowding around the mother. Use sterile materials, or the cleanest materials available. Clean towels or parts of the mother's clothing can be used. Place newspaper under the mother if nothing else is available. If she must lie on the ground, place a blanket or other covering under her. In order to prevent infection, refrain from direct contact with the vagina. Prepare for the delivery, by assisting the mother to lie on her back, with the knees bent and separated as far apart as possible. Remove any constricting clothing, or push it above her waist. When the baby's head reaches the outlet of the birth canal, the top of the head will first be seen during contractions, but will then become visible all the time. The mother will now feel a stretching, burning sensation. She must now no longer push during the contractions, and to avoid this, should pant like a dog on a hot day. This will allow the baby's head, to slide gently and painlessly out of the canal. If possible, allow the head to emerge between contractions. This will prevent the mother's skin from tearing, and will minimize trauma to the baby's head. It is important that the mother pant, instead of pushing, until both of the baby's shoulders have emerged. Delivery of the baby. As the baby is coming down the birth canal, keep the perineum red or pink, by massaging it with warm olive oil. If none is available, simply massage the area with your hand. Any place that gets white, will tear more easily, so keep massaging and keep all areas red. Use olive oil on the inside too, and pay special attention to the area at the bottom, as that is the most common place to tear. Do this massage during a contraction, when it will not be noticed, or it may irritate some women. You can support under the perineum, with your hand on top of a sterile gauze pad or washcloth. Do not hold it together, just support it so the baby's head can ease out. The other hand can gently press with the fingers around the baby's head, so it will not pop out too fast, causing tearing. As the baby's head is born, support it with your hand, so the face does not sit in a puddle of amniotic fluid. Gently wipe the face with a clean or sterile washcloth. Check quickly around the neck for the cord. If you feel it, just hook it with your finger, and pull it around the baby's head. Check again. Some are wrapped more than once. If the cord is so tight, it cannot be slipped over the baby's head, just wait until the baby is born to untangle it. Most cords are long enough to permit this. If the cord is too short to permit the baby to be born, it has to be cut and clamped, and the baby delivered rapidly. In this situation, the baby may be in distress, because the oxygen supply was cut off prematurely. With the next contraction, one of the shoulders comes, and then the whole body slips quickly out. If several contractions have passed without a shoulder coming, you may have to slip two fingers in, and try to find an armpit. With one or two fingers hooked under the armpit, try to rotate the shoulder counterclockwise, while pulling out. Usually this does it. As the baby's head emerges, it is usually face down. It then turns, so that the nose is turned towards the mother's thigh. Support the baby's head, by cradling it in your hands. Do not pull or exert any pressure. Help the shoulders out. For the lower shoulder, support the head, in an upward position. As the shoulders emerge, be prepared for the rest of the body to come quickly. Use the cleanest cloth or item available, to receive the baby. Make a record of the time, and approximate location, of the birth of the baby. With one hand, grasp the baby at the ankles, slipping a finger between the ankles. With the other hand, support the shoulders with the thumb and middle finger around its neck, and the forefinger on the head. Support the baby, but do not choke. Do not pull on the umbilical cord when picking the baby up. Raise the baby's body slightly higher than the head, in order to allow mucus and other fluid to drain from its nose and mouth. Be very careful, as newborn babies are very slippery. The baby will probably breathe and cry almost immediately. If the baby does not breathe spontaneously, very gently clear the mouth of mucus with your finger. Stimulate crying by gently rubbing its back. If all this fails, give extremely gentle mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Gently pull the lower jaw back, and breathe gently with small puffs, 20 puffs a minute. If there seems to be excess mucus, use your finger to gently clear the baby's mouth. The mother will probably want to hold the baby. 
This is desirable. If the umbilical cord is long enough, let her hold the baby in her arms. If the cord is short, support the baby on the mother's abdomen, and help her hold it there. It is a benefit to the baby, and makes with less bleeding, if the baby can be allowed to suckle at the breast, as soon as it is born. The cord should not be cut, until the afterbirth has completely emerged. The third stage. The placenta delivery or afterbirth is expelled by the womb, in a period of a few minutes to several hours after the baby is born. No attempt should be made, to pull it out using the cord. Immediately following the afterbirth, there may be additional bleeding and a few blood clots. The womb should feel like a firm grapefruit, just below the mother's navel. If it is soft, the baby should be encouraged to nurse, and the mother may be encouraged to gently massage the womb. These actions will cause it to contract, and lessen the chances of bleeding. In case of hemorrhaging, the uterus should be gently massaged to keep it hard. The woman should lie flat, and the bottom of the bed should be elevated. Put a cold pack, such as a small towel dipped in cold water and wrung out, on the lower tummy, to irritate the uterus to contract. Put pressure on the perineum with several sanitary napkins, and the pressure of your hand. Most importantly, have the baby nurse. Sucking stimulates the uterus to contract. Another problem to be alert for, is shock. Symptoms of shock are vacant eyes, dilated pupils, pale and cold or clammy skin, faint and rapid pulse, shallow and irregular breathing, dizziness, and vomiting. If you notice any of these symptoms, keep the woman warm, slightly elevate her feet and legs, use soft lights and talk softly and calmly to her. The baby has some danger of getting an infection through the cut cord, so it should not be cut until sterile conditions are available. If there is a possibility of getting medical help within a few hours, do not cut the cord, but leave it in the afterbirth attached to the baby. If there will be no medical help, wait until the afterbirth is out, or at least until the cord is whitened, and empty of blood. The cord should not be cut until it quits pulsating, so the baby can have a transition time, before he absolutely has to breathe on his own. As long as the cord is pulsating, the baby is still receiving oxygen from his mother. If the cord is long enough, the baby can be put on his mother's tummy, so she can hold him and talk to him. If not, the father should touch him and talk to him. After the cord has stopped pulsating and has become limp, it can be clamped or tied about one inch from the baby's tummy, with a cord or sterile cloth, and then cut. As the placenta separates from the uterus, the cord will appear longer. Wait for the delivery of the placenta. It will usually be about 10 minutes or longer, before the placenta is delivered. Never pull on the cord. When the placenta appears, grasp gently, and rotate it clockwise. Then tie the cord in two places, about 6 inches from the baby, using strips of material that has been boiled or held in a hot flame. The placenta and attached membranes, must be saved for a doctor's inspection. Leaving the cord and placenta attached to the baby is messy, but safe. Save all soiled sheets, blankets and cloths, for a doctor's examination. Check the amount of vaginal bleeding, a small amount, 1-2 to two cups, is expected. Place sanitary pads or other sanitary material, around birth areas. Then cover mother and baby, but do not allow them to overheat. Continue to check the baby's color and respiration. The baby should not appear blue or yellowish. When necessary, gently flick your fingers on the soles of the baby's feet. This will encourage it to cry. Mother will probably need light nourishment, and will wish to rest and watch her baby. She should keep her hand away from the area surrounding the birth outlet. If uncontaminated water is available, she may wish to wash off her thighs. She may get up and go to the bathroom, or seek better shelter. All care should be taken, to avoid introducing infection into the birth canal. The mother can expect some vaginal discharge for several days. This is usually reddish for the first day or so, but lightens and becomes less profuse within a few days. Stay with the mother until relieved by competent personnel. This is a relatively dangerous period for the mother, as hemorrhage and shock may occur. Almost all emergency births are normal. The babies typically thrive, and the mothers recover quickly. It is especially important, when assisting with an emergency delivery, that you continually reassure the mother, and attempt to keep her calm. Care of the mother. Wash the mother, and place dressing combines or sanitary pads in place. Take her pulse, assess her color, and check carefully for any further bleeding, and what you may consider to be excessive blood loss. Provided she is conscious, and not ill or drowsy, give her warm, sweet drinks, and encourage her to rest. Keep her under constant observation. Retain all blood-stained towels and pads, for medical examination. If requested by the mother, 
assist her with cleaning herself up, and in changing her clothing. I'd like to introduce you to Noel. Noel is a high fidelity birth simulator, and this is what we use for students before they actually have their clinical placements and work with real people. And today, as we can see, Noel is in a semi-recumbent position, which I have to say is not ideal for normal birth, but for the process of showing you today, this is how I've um, asked Noel to um, take up her position. Um, it's important that we can see the vulva for us to know if birth is imminent. So we need to make sure Noelle is comfortable, that her legs are parted so that the diameters of the pelvis are as wide as they can be, and that you are visualizing the uh, vagina. Now, to ensure that this area is as clean as it possibly can be, I have placed underneath Noelle a sterile field, a sterile sheet, and I've also placed one here in anticipation of the baby. We would be listening to the fetal heart and the mother's vital signs. But now we are going to concentrate on whether there is any visualis visualization of our baby. So if you can take a little peek here, you can just see the baby's head descending down the pelvis and entering the uh, lower vagina. And there is, it's not necessary to touch, it's just being with woman, reassuring the woman and telling her what's about to happen. So I will be speaking to Noelle as if she is a real woman. So I will say, Noelle, are you okay? Because soon your baby's going to be born and it's going to sting somewhat, but I'm going to support and assist you. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use one of these small pads I showed you earlier, and I'm just going to place that over the anal area to try and make this area as clean as it possibly can be. So this is then placed just below and just to cover the anus. And as you can see now, we can anticipate an imminent birth. You can see signs of the presenting part that we refer to as cephalic, and we can see it descending into a situation where we need now to be prepared. So we've got our hand now poised in anticipation that the mother may decide to push involuntarily. At this stage, I would tell me, um, Noel, Noel, your head, the baby's head is about to crown and I don't want you to push. I want you to breathe nicely and just pant when I tell you. It's important we tell the woman to pant because we do not want that hair to be birthed too quickly because of, of course, the brain within the fetal skull is very, very delicate and therefore we do not want this imminent champagne cork type birth. So at this stage now, you can just see this much of the baby's head is about to crown. Again, reassuring Noel. Noel, this might sting at the moment, I know, but you must concentrate and work with me now for us to have the safe birth of your baby. You're doing really well. Constant reassurance. And at this stage now, the head is crowning, and I'm wanting Michelle, Noel, to birth. Pant. Panting actually stops the woman wanting to push. Well, it dissuades the woman wanting to push. It reduces that urge. That is physiological because once that baby's head hits the perineum and hits the lower pelvic floor, it is a natural reflex for the woman wanting to push. Here we go. Pant now the Noel. So my hand is placed now just to ease and protect and support. And as you can see, the head is slowly birthing. Pant and 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 pant. Well done. This is fantastic. The baby's head is born. And this is a wonderful moment to reassure the mother that most of the difficult part of the birth is over. At this stage, it's important now to check whether the cord is around the baby's neck. So with one finger, I just check around the neck and I'm glad to say on this occasion, there is no umbilical cord. But if there was, all one would have to do is slip the umbilical cord over the head or in anticipation of our trolley, 
if the cord was too tight we would have to clamp it on two sides and then cut the cord. It's not ideal, it's only if it's not possible to release the loop of cord. At this stage now we need to wait and we need to wait now for Noel to have another contraction for us to deliver the rest of the baby. The baby's head has been born and now we need to wait for the mother to have a contraction so that we can deliver the rest of the baby. Don't forget you must keep communicating with the woman at all times. Noel, do you feel another contraction coming? Yes? Wonderful. If you feel that you want to push, you can. We need now to deliver the baby's shoulders and therefore all that's necessary is gentle downward traction on the baby's head, very gently, and then ever so gently you can move your hands supporting the baby's head and with lateral flexion you take the baby and you place it on the mother's abdomen and wrap the baby to keep the baby warm and introduce the baby to his or her mummy and this is communication at all times Noel your baby's born and of course at this stage, we are anticipating a healthy baby with a good APGA score, which is marking the baby out of 10 for its general condition. We can see the umbilical cord is still attached, and because we haven't given any drugs on this occasion, we're in no rush to cut this cord. So we will allow the baby to recover. We take the baby a little closer to mum, and of course, an amazing Thing to do at this stage, given we've got enough umbilical cord, is to encourage skin to skin. And we just pop the baby, there we go baby, with your mum. Skin to skin, keeps the baby warm, regulates the temperature and heart rate. And there we are, and of course we at all times maintain thermoregulation, keep the baby warm. And there is mum and baby having skin to skin and we have now got a time to wait for the placenta to separate. As we're waiting for signs of placental separation, we've got our preparation and mother and baby are progressing well and we will now wait for signs of placental separation. Febrile patients. Febrile meaning, having or showing the symptoms of fever. A disease is a disorder in a human, animal, or plant, caused by infection, diet or by faulty functioning of a process. When a person has a disease, signs or symptoms of the disorder will display. For example, hay fever causes sneezing, runny nose, and eyes the symptoms of the disorder. The study of disease is called pathology. Pathology includes determining, the cause of the known as ethology understanding of the mechanisms, of how the disease develops known as pathogenesis. The structural changes, that take place in the human body, that are associated with the disease, known as morphological changes. And the functional consequences of these changes. Meaning what happens to the body, as a result of these changes. Before a disease can be treated effectively, the cause of a disease, first has to be identified. Fever. Fever is defined as, a body temperature that is one, or more degrees higher than normal. Normal body temperature differs from person, to person. Depending on the age, by the time of day, and by the part of the body where it is measured. Factors that can influence the temperature, may include strenuous exercise, medicines, or even excitement, can also affect body temperature. The person's temperature, can be measured with a thermometer in the mouth, ear, or rectum, or under the armpit. When the temperature is measured in the mouth. A temperature between 97 to 99 degrees Fahrenheit, or 36.1 to 37.2 degrees Celsius, is considered normal. A temperature of 100 to 102 degrees Fahrenheit, or 37.8 to 38.9 degrees Celsius, is usually called a low-grade fever. A temperature of 103 degrees Fahrenheit, or 39.5 degrees Celsius, or higher is called a high-grade fever warning. Generally, oral temperatures of 102 degrees Fahrenheit, or 38.9 degrees Celsius, 
or higher are fevers that may be more serious. How to measure temperature. A checklist was provided on how to measure the temperature. Step 1, the first aider must use a sterile thermometer. Step 2, insert the thermometer into the mouth, under the tongue or armpit, or the ear. Step 3, leave the thermometer in place for 3 to 5 minutes. Step 4, read the thermometer where the line of mercury ends. Temperatures measured in the ear, or rectum are higher than oral temperatures by 1 half to 1 degree Fahrenheit, or about 1 half degree Celsius, and temperatures measured in the armpit are lower by 1 half to 1 degree Fahrenheit. What causes fever? A fever is a symptom, and not a disease. Fever can be a sign, that the body is fighting an infection, and may occur with viral or bacterial infections, such as ear infections, the flu, severe colds, sore throats, pneumonia, stomach viruses, or urinary tract infections. A fever may also be a symptom, of other types or sorts of medical problems, such as dehydration, a thyroid disorder, or an autoimmune problem. How is it treated? When a person has a fever, it does not mean that the person has a serious illness, or needs medicine. Older adults may have a serious infection, and not have a fever. For low-grade fevers below 102 degrees Fahrenheit or 38.9 degrees Celsius, the person should get plenty of rest, and drink lots of fluids, especially water. Dress in light, comfortable clothing. Do not cover the person in heavy clothes, or blankets. Keep the room cool, but not uncomfortable. Cold injuries. Hypothermia. Hypothermia means the generalized cooling of the body. It can develop quickly, when the body is emerged in cold water, or more gradually when the body is subjected to a cold environment, for several hours. Signs and symptoms. Altered level of consciousness. Lethargy, unwilling to move. Slow, weak pulse and breathing. Shivering with uncoordinated muscular moving. As condition deteriorates, shivering will stop. End. Skin extremely cold to touch, with loss of sensation. Management. Remove patient from the cold environment. Check CABs very carefully. Restrict handling to the minimum, when removing wet and cold clothing. Do not massage, or rub the skin to warm him up. Cover the body, not extremities, with a space blanket or direct contact with a warm body. Keep patient still and manage shock. The patient must be hospitalized. End. Only in case of mild hypothermia, a warm drink may be given. No caffeine or alcohol may be given. Frostbite. Frostbite is the term applied to cold injuries, where there is a destruction of tissue by freezing. It is the most serious form of localized cold injury. It normally affects the ears, nose, chin, hands, and feet. Signs and symptoms. Skin appears white and waxy. Skin is icy cold, and affected part is hard to the touch. End. The affected area feels numb, but there may be stinging or aching sensation. Treatment. Do not massage the affected part. Start warming body parts gradually with skin-to-skin -skin contact, or lukewarm water. Start with cold water, and gradually make the water warmer until it is lukewarm. Do not expose affected areas with dry, or radiant heat. Refer to advanced medical help. Heat illnesses. Heat cramps. It is painful muscular spasms, which occur during strenuous activity, excessive perspiration in areas with high humidity, when the body loses water, and mineral salts. Treatment. Do not attempt to massage the muscle. Remove the patient from the warm environment, to a cooler one. Give water, or half-strength isotonic drink if available. Heat exhaustion. Definition. A condition that develops, due to loss of fluids and mineral salts for example, perspiration. If not recognized and managed, heat stroke may develop. Signs and symptoms. Early signs. Excessive sweating and warm skin. Later signs. Cold, clammy skin. Restless and or confused. Shallow rapid breathing. Faint rapid pulse. Nausea and or vomiting. Fainting may occur. Headache. Dizziness and blurred vision. Muscle cramps. And. Very thirsty. Treatment. Place person in a cool spot. Manage shock. Remove excessive clothing. Give water or isotonic drink. Heat stroke. Definition. Occurs when the body is subjected to more heat than it can handle, and the normal mechanisms for regulating body temperature, are overwhelmed. It is a life-threatening condition. 
Signs and symptoms. Not sweating at all. Body temperature rises. Skin warm and dry. Confused and or delirious. Rapid breathing. Full and bouncy pulse. Vomiting. Unconsciousness or convulsions. End. Severe headache. Treatment. Remove excessive clothing. Cool body immediately for example, in a bath, with garden hose. In a draft for example, wind or fan. Manage shock. Measures to prevent heat illnesses. Avoid outdoor physical activities, during the hottest part of the day. Avoid sudden changes of temperature, for example, air out a car before getting in. Drink 8 to 10 glasses of water, when you are working in hot weather. Do not leave old people, or children waiting in a car on a hot day. Gastroenteritis, is an acute infectious syndrome of the stomach lining and the intestine. Numerous viruses, bacteria, and parasites can cause gastroenteritis. Microorganisms cause gastroenteritis, by secreting toxins that stimulate excessive water and electrolyte loss. Thereby causing watery diarrhea, or by directly invading the walls of the gut, triggering inflammation, that upsets the balance between the absorption of nutrients and the secretion of wastes. It is characterized by diarrhea, vomiting, and abdominal cramps. Other symptoms can include nausea, fever, and chills. The severity of gastroenteritis varies from a sudden but transient attack of diarrhea, to severe dehydration. Diarrhea is the passage of loose, watery, or unformed stools. Diarrhea may be accompanied by cramping, and can occur quickly, especially in the elderly and in children. Replacing fluids and electrolytes is of primary importance. Diarrhea flushes bacteria and parasites out of the body, therefore, letting diarrhea run its course is best. Diarrhea may be a symptom of the following, intestinal infection, caused by bacteria, viruses and parasites. Food poisoning, food sensitivity, or allergies can also cause diarrhea. Treatment involves letting person drink a lot of clear fluids. When the person can tolerate clear fluids, give mild foods such as soup and gelatin. Take the patient to a medical doctor if they have bloody stools, which might appear black or tarry. Also, ache medical assistance if the symptoms do not improve after 24 hours, or the person has a fever, constant abdominal pain or severely dehydrated. Vomiting and diarrhea can occur separately or together, but both can cause the body to lose vital fluids and salts. The aim is to prevent dehydration, by giving frequent sips of water, even if the casualty is vomiting. Treatment involves reassuring the casualty. Get them to sit down and make sure they are comfortable. If the casualty is vomiting, give them a warm damp cloth to wipe their face, and keep reassuring them. When the casualty has stopped vomiting, give them sips of water or unsweetened fruit juice. You can also give them an oral rehydration solution. When the casualty is feeling hungry again, advise them to eat foods that are easily digested, such as bread, pasta, or potatoes for the first 24 hours. If you are concerned about a casualty's condition, particularly if they are a child or an older person, or if the vomiting and diarrhea persists, seek medical advice. Mumps is also called epidemic parotitis, and is an acute contagious disease caused by a virus, and characterized by inflammatory swelling of the salivary glands. It frequently occurs as an epidemic, and most commonly affects young persons, who are between 5 and 15 years of age. The incubation period is about 17 to 21 days after contact. Danger of transmission begins one week before symptoms appear, and lasts about two weeks. Mumps generally sets in with symptoms of a slightly feverish cold, soon followed by swelling and stiffening, in the region of the parotid salivary gland in front of the ear. The swelling rapidly increases, and spreads toward the neck and under the jaw, involving the numerous glands there. The condition is often found on both sides of the face. Pain is seldom severe, nor is there much redness or any tendency to discharge pus. There is, however, interference with chewing and swallowing. After four or five days the swelling subsides. In patients past puberty, there is occasionally swelling and tenderness in other glands, such as the testicles in males, and the breasts or ovaries in females. There is rarely involvement of the pancreas, but these are of short duration and usually of no serious significance. The testicles may become atrophied, but sterility from this cause is uncommon. Mumps itself requires no special treatment. A single attack usually confers lifelong immunity. Infection with the mumps virus was once common in childhood, but the frequency of infection was drastically reduced, with the introduction in 1967 of routine immunization, for prevention of the disease, 
with a vaccine made from weakened live mumps virus. This vaccine is administered after the age of about one year, often in combination with measles and rubella vaccines. Measles is also called rubiola, and is a contagious viral disease marked by fever, cough, conjunctivitis, and a characteristic rash. Measles is commonest in children, but may appear in older persons who have escaped it earlier in life. Infants are immune up to four or five months of age, if the mother has had the disease. Immunity to measles following an attack is usually lifelong. Measles is so highly communicable, that the slightest contact with an active case may infect a susceptible person. After an incubation period of about 10 days, the patient develops fever, redness and watering of the eyes, profuse nasal discharge, and congestion of the mucous membranes of the nose and throat. These symptoms are often mistaken for those of a severe cold. This period of invasion lasts for 48 to 96 hours. The fever increases with appearance of a blotchy rash, and the temperature may rise as high as 40 degrees Celsius, when the rash reaches its maximum. 24 to 36 hours before the rash develops, there appear in the mucous membranes of the mouth typical maculae, called complex spots. These spots are bluish-white specks, surrounded by bright red areas. After a day or two the rash becomes a deeper red and gradually fades, the temperature drops rapidly, and the catarrhal symptoms disappear. No drug is effective against measles. The only treatment required is control of fever, rest in bed, protection of the eyes, care of the bowels, and sometimes steam inhalations to relieve irritation of the bronchial tree. When no complications occur, the illness lasts 10 days. Uncomplicated measles is seldom fatal. Deaths attributed to measles usually result from secondary bronchopneumonia, caused by bacterial organisms entering the inflamed bronchial tree. On the other hand, complications of measles are frequent, and include a superimposed bacterial ear infection, or pneumonia or a primary measles lung infection. Whooping cough is also called pertussis and is an acute, highly communicable respiratory disease, characterized in its typical form by paroxysms of coughing, followed by a long-drawn inspiration, or whoop. The coughing ends with the expulsion of clear, sticky mucus, and often with vomiting. Whooping cough is caused by the bacterium Bordetella pertussis. Beginning its onset after an incubation period of approximately one week, the illness progresses through three stages, namely catarrhal, paroxysmal, and convalescent. Together they last six to eight weeks. Catarrhal symptoms are those of a cold, with a short dry cough that is worse at night, red eyes, and a low-grade fever. After one to two weeks, the catarrhal stage passes into the distinctive paroxysmal period, variable in duration, but commonly lasting four to six weeks. In the paroxysmal state, there is a repetitive series of coughs that are exhausting, and often result in vomiting. The infected person may appear blue, with bulging eyes, and be dazed and apathetic, but the periods between coughing paroxysms are comfortable. Infants with the disease require careful monitoring, because breathing may temporarily stop during coughing spells. Sedatives may be administered to induce rest and sleep, and sometimes the use of an oxygen tent is required to ease breathing. Tetanus is also called lockjaw, and is an acute infectious disease of humans and other animals. Tetanus is caused by toxins produced by the Bacillus clostridium tetany, and characterized by rigidity and spasms of the voluntary muscles. The almost constant involvement of the jaw muscles, accounts for the popular name of the disease. Spores of clostridium are distributed widely in nature, especially in soil, and may enter the body through any wound, even a superficial abrasion. Puncture wounds and deep lacerations are particularly dangerous, because they provide the oxygen-free environment needed for growth of the microorganism. Treatment of tetanus is primarily supportive. Tetanus antitoxin which contains antibodies derived from the blood of persons who have been immunized against the disease, is given to help neutralize the toxin in the bloodstream. But it has little effect once the toxin has affected the nerve endings. Intravenous penicillin kills the organisms that remain within the wound site. Tuberculosis is an infectious disease that is caused by the tubercle bacillus, mycobacterium tuberculosis. In most forms of the disease, the bacillus spreads slowly and widely in the lungs, causing the formation of hard nodules, known as tubercles, or large, cheese-like masses that break down the respiratory tissues and form cavities in the lungs. Blood vessels also can be eroded by the advancing disease, causing the infected person to cough up bright red blood. In less developed countries where population is dense, and hygienic standards are poor, tuberculosis remains a major fatal disease. 
In addition, the prevalence of the disease has increased in association with the HIV epidemic. Tuberculosis is one of the main causes of death among AIDS patients. Finally, some new strains of the tubercle bacillus that are resistant to conventional antibiotics have appeared, requiring the use of combinations of drugs. Infection spreads primarily by the respiratory route directly from an infected person, who discharges lived bacilli into the air. Minute droplets ejected by sneezing, coughing, and even talking, can contain hundreds of tubercle bacilli that may be inhaled by a healthy person. There the bacilli become trapped in the tissues of the body, are surrounded by immune cells, and finally are sealed up in hard, nodular tubercles. The treatment of tuberculosis now consists of drug therapy and good general care. With early drug treatment, surgery is now rarely needed. One problem with drug therapies, however, is that the bacilli may become resistant to some of the drugs, this is avoided mainly by giving combinations of drugs. The patient is usually made non-infectious quite quickly, but complete cure requires continuous treatment for several months at least. If the patient does not continue treatment for the required time, or is treated with only one drug, the resistant bacilli will multiply, and the patient will become sick again. Hepatitis is an inflammation of the liver that results from a variety of causes, both infectious and non-infectious. The signs and symptoms of acute viral hepatitis result from damage to the liver, and are similar regardless of the hepatitis virus responsible. Patients may experience a flu-like illness, and general symptoms include nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, fever, fatigue, loss of appetite, and, less commonly, rash, and joint pain. Sometimes jaundice, a yellowing of the skin and eyes, will develop. The acute symptomatic phase of viral hepatitis usually lasts from a few days to several weeks. The period of jaundice that may follow can persist from one to three weeks. Hepatitis A caused by the hepatitis A virus is the most common worldwide. The onset of hepatitis A usually occurs 15 to 45 days after exposure to the virus, and some infected individuals, especially children, exhibit no clinical manifestations. In the majority of cases, no special treatment other than bed rest is required, most recover fully from the disease. Hepatitis A does not give rise to chronic hepatitis. The severity of the disease can be reduced, if the affected individual is injected within two weeks of exposure, with immune serum globulin obtained from persons exposed to hepatitis A. Hepatitis B is a much more severe, and longer-lasting disease than hepatitis A. Symptoms usually appear from 40 days to 6 months after exposure to the hepatitis B virus. Those persons at greatest risk for contracting hepatitis B include intravenous drug users, sexual partners of individuals with the disease, healthcare workers who are not adequately immunized, and recipients of organ transplants or blood transfusions. A safe and effective vaccine against hepatitis B is available, and provides protection for at least 5 years. Symptoms of hepatitis C usually appear within 6 to 9 weeks after exposure. Hepatitis C appears to be transmitted in a manner similar to hepatitis B. Hepatitis C has a greater propensity than hepatitis B to develop into chronic liver disease. Alcoholics who are infected with hepatitis C are more prone to develop cirrhosis. The treatment for hepatitis C is a combination of alpha interferon and ribivirin. Only about half of those receiving these drugs respond. The eye is a robust but delicate organ. It can sustain quite severe damage and, with the proper treatment, recover to its former state. In some instances, however, a seemingly minor injury can be permanently disabling. Always consider preventing eye injuries and taking sufficient protective measures, such as protected glasses or goggles. Generally, eye injuries are considered as either minor or major injuries. Minor eye injuries are injuries where the eye has come in contact with a foreign object, causing minor irritation, or the object remains on the surface of the eye. It is characterized by a bloodshot eye, irritation and an urge to rub the eye. Care and treatment involves the following. Irrigate the eye in order to wash the object out. If this fails, touch the corner of a clean wet cloth to the object and lift it off the surface. Refer to medical aid if vision is affected. Cover the affected eye if appropriate. Avoid pushing the object around the eye's surface. Only use eye drops if prescribed by a doctor, and remember to check the expiry date. Major eye injuries are injuries that involve the penetration of the body of the eye, or involve severe blunt trauma to the eye. These injuries are characterized by blood in the eye, penetrating objects, disturbance of vision, protrusion of eye contents, and severe pain and spasms. Patient care in this case is critical, and should be left to the experts. 
lay the patient flat with complete rest, and call an ambulance. Cover both eyes, to avoid eyeball movement and hence worsening the trauma. If the patient becomes anxious, remove the unaffected eye cover, and reassure the patient. Do not remove any penetrating object. Attempts to transport the patient other than by ambulance should be resisted. Eye drops are not to be used under any circumstances. Flash burn and welder's flash, is the result of staring or inadvertently looking at the intense light caused during metal welding, while not wearing the correct eye protection. Care must be taken to supervise children, if welding is being conducted near them, and they should be removed from the location. The damage caused to the eye's cornea by exposure to this intense light can be painful, and in some cases, permanent. Lay the patient flat with complete rest. Apply cool compresses and cover the eyes with pads. Urgent medical attention is required if pain or spots persist. Most ear problems are not life-threatening, but fast action may be needed to relieve pain and prevent or reverse hearing loss. Do not use tweezers or try to pry objects in the ear out, unless the object can be seen near the ear canal opening. Rather seek medical care to remove an object. For a live insect in ear canal, shine a small light into ear. If the insect does not crawl out toward light, pour warm water into the ear and then drain it. When draining water, turn the head to the side. If the insect cannot be removed, seek medical assistance. Some head injuries can be seen when fluids drain from the ear. Blood or clear fluid draining from ear may indicate skull fracture. Do not attempt to stop the bleeding or clear fluid draining, with or without blood coming from ear. Doing so could increase pressure on brain, causing permanent damage. Place a sterile gauze dressing over the ear, and loosely bandage in place to prevent bacteria getting into the brain. Stabilize the head and neck against movement. Have the patient remain as still as possible. Shock. Shock, occurs when the body's circulation system, does not supply enough oxygenated blood, to the body tissue. In plain language, it means that there is a sudden drop in blood pressure, and the heart, the blood pump of the body, no longer acts as pump, but starts acting like a machine, and starts beating so fast, that it actually does not pump blood efficiently to the body. All external bleeding must be controlled. Common symptoms. The following symptoms could be present. Cold and eventually blue skin. Skin may be moist. The patient may be very weak. Pale. Altered consciousness. Restlessness or irritability. Have a rapid pulse. Breathe rapidly. Treatment. The patient must be laid down, feet elevated not more than 20 centimeters, and are covered with a blanket to maintain his or her body temperature. The patient must be calmed down and reassured of assistance and help. Medical assistance must be called immediately. The breathing and pulse of the patient must be monitored, and the patient should not be left alone. No food or liquids must be given. The patient may need surgery. Food and liquids would only worsen the situation and cause nausea resulting in vomiting. The shock position and when to use it. Normally the lower extremities should be elevated. This may improve the blood supply to the heart. If suspected of fractures, the leg should not be elevated if not well splinted. Ideally the patient should lie on one side so that if he or she vomits, it will not block the airway, this preventing asphyxiation. There are different types of shock. We will discuss a few types. Hypovolemic shock. This is the most common type of shock, and based on insufficient circulating volume. Its primary cause is loss of fluid from the circulation, from either an internal, or external source. An internal source may be hemorrhage. External causes may include extensive bleeding, or severe burns. Distributive shock. As in hypovolemic shock, there is an insufficient, intravascular volume of blood. This form of relative hypovolemia, is the result of dilation of blood vessels, which diminishes systemic vascular resistance. Examples of this form of shock are septic and anaphylactic shock. Septic shock, is caused by an overwhelming infection. Anaphylactic shock, is caused by a severe allergic reaction to an allergen, antigen, drug, or foreign protein, causing the release of histamine, which causes widespread vasodilation. This leads to hypotension, and increased capillary permeability. Signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock. Anxiety, restlessness, altered mental state, due to decreased cerebral perfusion, and subsequent hypoxia. Hypotension, due to decrease in circulatory volume. A rapid, weak, thready pulse, due to decreased blood flow. Cool, clammy skin. 
rapid and shallow respirations due to sympathetic nervous system stimulation and acidosis. Hypothermia, due to decreased perfusion and evaporation of sweat. Thirst and dry mouth, due to fluid depletion. Fatigue, due to inadequate oxygenation. Cold and mottled skin, especially in the extremities, due to insufficient perfusion of the skin. Distracted look in the eyes, or staring into space, often with pupils dilated. Signs and symptoms of anaphylactic shock. Skin eruptions, and large welts. Localized edema, especially around the face. Weak and rapid pulse. Breathlessness and cough, due to narrowing of airways, and swelling of the throat. Treatment of hypovolemic shock. In hypovolemic shock, caused by bleeding, it is necessary to immediately control the bleeding. Thereafter, follow treatment as for shock. Insulin is a hormone produced by the pancreas, that assists the body in using energy from food. Diabetes develops when insulin is either ineffective, or lacking in the body. Type 1 diabetes is commonly diagnosed in childhood, and requires external insulin. If deprived, the person will become extremely ill. Type 2 diabetes is formerly known as non-insulin dependent, or adult onset diabetes. Incidence of type 2 diabetes is reaching epidemic proportions, and excess body weight and a sedentary lifestyle are risk factors. Other risk factors for type 2 diabetes are family history, and age older than 45 years. These patients may require insulin replacement and other medication. Gestational diabetes occurs in some pregnancies, and usually ends after the baby is born. Gestational diabetes can develop into type 2 diabetes, and is caused by hormones produced during pregnancy. This is usually treated with diet. Low blood glucose level, known as hypoglycemia, occurs for several reasons, such as too much insulin, too little or delayed food intake, exercise, alcohol, or any combination of these factors. The symptoms of hyper and hypoglycemia are remarkably similar. Hyperglycemia is when the insulin level in the body is too low, and the blood sugar level is too high. If this condition is not corrected, the patient may go into a diabetic coma. Common symptoms of hypoglycemia, include moist, cold and eventually blue skin. The patient will be very weak and pale. Altered consciousness will occur, with the restlessness or irritability. The patient will have a rapid pulse, and will breathe rapidly. To treat a hypoglycemic patient, the patient must be laid down, feet elevated not more than 20 centimeters, and be covered with a blanket to maintain his or her body temperature. The patient has to be calmed down, and reassured of assistance and help. The breathing and pulse of the patient must be monitored, and then the patient should not be left alone. If unconscious, place the patient in the recovery position. No food or liquids must be given and call the emergency services. High blood glucose levels, presented as a diabetic coma and hyperglycemia, occurs when a diabetic has too much glucose in the blood. This is caused by insufficient insulin, overeating, illness, inactivity, stress, or a combination of these factors. Signs and symptoms include drowsiness, extreme thirst, very frequent urination, and vomiting. The patient's skin will be warm, red and dry, and the patient's breath will have a fruity odor. The patient will have heavy breathing and will eventually turn unconsciousness. The signs and symptoms will occur gradually, hours to days, because some glucose is still reaching the brain. Always look for a medical identification tag, as most diabetics have one. Give frequent, small sips of water if the person with diabetes can swallow. Do not give insulin, unless the person with diabetes can self-administer it. Call the emergency services immediately.